What they're doing to this other person is unacceptable and their backstory is not an excuse. In this moment, they're harming someone else. Their backstory doesn't matter. You can be empathic and protect yourself. You can say they have had, they've had a rough life and their behavior is unacceptable. Why the hell is it so hard for people to leave a narcissistic person in a relationship mm -hmm. even when their lives are at risk? So there's, there's a continuum. So it's, it's even in, when in a case where there might be physical abuse or danger, and I almost view that as a separate side issue because I think the vast majority of narcissistic relationships are not violent, right? And I think it's important to make that distinction because a lot of people who are going through a narcissistically emotionally abusive relationship where there isn't physical violence feels like well I'm not going through that so maybe this isn't that bad right so I think that that becomes the, the physical abuse piece we'll put over mm -hmm. to the side and we'll get to it but the other thing to remember that what's unique about narcissistic abuse is that every day isn't bad there are enough good moments in there and that's that nature of that trauma bond there's enough good moments and the good moments create buy-in they create confusion they foster the justification so a person's like we had so much fun over the weekend i you know i think he's so attractive i think she's so much fun i i we have um we went on a beautiful vacation uh he got the promotion and since he got the promotion things are going great right so there's something to hang your hat on. And I think that what a lot of people get confused with is they think, they hear about these relationships and they think, well, if every day is so bad, why didn't you leave? I said, if every day was so bad, they would leave. Every day's not so bad. Over time, even if every day, it starts getting closer to every day, every moment being bad, those justifications that were created by that alternation that might have been there in the beginning become so strong that the person's really in it and they're confused. So they're wondering, maybe this is me. The partner, my partner keeps telling me it's me. Maybe they're right. I wasn't as nice as I could have been, or I was this, or I was that, and especially if it's a legacy issue, if it comes from family of origin issues. So I think the complexity is if it's so bad, then why isn't it, you know, why is it so difficult for people to get out of these situations? Partly it's that, partly it's practical stuff. You know, it's um, financial fear, fear of being alone, having children, um, um, culture, religion, you know, all those things are very real and they're not to be shamed in a person. Prison's like, well, I guess I'm weak because I'm staying in it for the money. And I'm like, listen, for some people, they'll say, I don't know if I'd be able to afford to keep staying where I am or I have kids and I have to worry about that. Or I have a chronic illness and I don't know how I'd support that. I've, I've had people say, I'm staying for the insurance benefits. And I, and I say to them, don't shame yourself. Be clear on it. Because what happens is, let me give you that example. Person says, this is a mess. We have a lot of bad days. We have a few good days. I've justified it for years. Now I see it clearly. I've had a chronic illness. It's hard. I can't work full time. I've been in this marriage for 30 years. A lot of myself has been invested in it. I, if I don't have these benefits, I'm going to get really sick. Uh, I, I, all that's great. I say, okay, understand why you're staying. That, that, that right now there's a need that comes you, and you have been hamstrung and whatever else. That, that Understand why you're staying so you can see the rest of it clearly and to say and i'm aware that this person is invalidating and cruel and manipulative and gaslighting i am going to commit to no longer deriving my identity from this relationship this is not my fault and so disconnecting the emotion from that person it's disconnecting your sense of identity from that person mm -hmm. because when we're in relationships listen we use other people's as people as reference points right mm -hmm. and i think we underestimate how important that is the human the human species takes in social cues. That's why, you know, part of why with these big brains is we're able to integrate so much, right? So I'm reading your face. So I'll be frank with you, Lisa. If you were just sort of like flat face, not nodding, kind of looking away, you know, just sort of uninterested in me, I might, my a moment, my tendency was either is she not liking what I'm saying? Does she think I'm dumb? Maybe I'm doing a bad job, right? We'd go down this cascade. We get our social cues from everyone. Mm -hmm. You and I aren't in a close, you know, we're close friends, but it's not like I'm with you every day. I don't derive my identity. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't derive my identity mm. from you, right? You know, I val you're in a, a part of me. I, you know, I, you're a dear friend, so I'm, you know, I value you in that way. And some of my identity has been shaped by you in a good way, in a very good way. However, 
in a in a narcissistic relationship, you're not allowed to be yourself. Mm -hmm. If you bring your real self into the relationship, your needs, your wants, your aspirations, your hopes, that narcissistic person is like, hello, are we talking about something that doesn't have to do with me? Stop. You do not need to exist. Like, don't be a thing in my world unless I need you. Mm -hmm. And an example I always give is imagine you're in your kitchen and you're like, it's morning. Yo, my, I got to have a cup of coffee. You're interacting with your coffee machine. Great. Now imagine if it's 1130 in the morning, your coffee machine starts talking to you. You'd be like, what? what Hello, what are you, why are you interrupting me, oh, coffee machine? After you got past the sort of psychosis part of it, you'd say, um, you're a coffee machine. You shouldn't be talking to me. Now, that's how the narcissist views you. Uh, hello, do you, um, I got my coffee from you. I don't, please do not mm -hmm. make your stuff my stuff. I, I'm not interested in you. Mm -hmm. You don't get to have an identity separate from them in that relationship. And so the mistake people make, and it's not a mistake, it's wanting a normal human relationship, is they come in and they be themselves. Well, if yourself is at odds with what the narcissist wants, they're gonna shut that down, mm -hmm. which means the only way the relationship works is if you cut off all those parts of yourself and only live in existence and in line with what they want. And people, it's not that this happens overnight, this happens over years. And then one day a person looks up and says, who am I? And who am I outside of this relationship? Because you've so trimmed your identity mm. to fit this, fit this space. And the narcissistic person is very convenienced by what you're doing. And, and because maybe the number of fights drops, the number of conflicts drops, you're like, I'm doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. But what you're actually doing is getting rid of yourself. Wow, I didn't expect that last line. Oh my God, that hit me so hard. Um, You've got rid of yourself, god damn. Okay, so how do you, in this situation like you've just laid out, you've decided I need to stay in this relationship or I've chosen to stay in this narcissistic relationship because of X reason. Mm -hmm. And so you've gone back and you've looked, how do you start to re rebuild yourself within that narcissistic relationship? So there's two sets of reasons, right? The e in some ways, the practical reasons are the easy reasons, right? Because they're kind of superficial, right? This is what my faith requires. This is what my culture says. Housing is expensive. Lisa, I cannot tell you how many people over the years I've had to walk through narcissistic relationships in LA where the housing is so expensive. Mm. And they're like, I can't, we can't, neither of us can afford to leave this. Like, so in, in the way a divorce works, right? You've got to either right. buy the other person out. So a house they might've bought for $300,000 now is now worth 2 million. Neither of them has a million bucks to buy the other one out. Mm -hmm. But if they sell the house, what they're left with isn't enough to acquire a new residence. So some people are saying, it's a practicality thing. My job's in LA, I can't, you know, so they're making these really, really painful decisions on the basis of practical things like that. Now, the nice thing about that is you can make sense of that. Like you're, it's very clear, I'm staying this in this for the money. A person has to break through the shame of that because there is no shame. You know, I was like, that's a practical reason. What's your, what's your option? You know, you know where, know where to live. Like, it's really to say, I get this. I also get people saying, I'm staying for my kids. And then once they get to a point where the kids have more autonomy, sometimes it's the kid's 18th birthday, that day they march down to the court and say, I'm filing for divorce. So people figure that those are the, I hate to say it, easy parts. The harder part is the trauma bonded piece where those good days are making you justify. And what in that case, you have to give up on the thing that's kept you going for years or decades, which is this might get better. Maybe it will get better. Maybe if I wait another six months, a year till they retire, till this, till that, till blah, till da. And so it's been an entire, it's been a lifetime of chasing a carrot, of chasing a moving goalpost. So now you're saying you can't, it's done. Like there's no, the game is rigged. You can't win the game. So there's no more hope. It'll always be like this. And the justification cycle has to end. That's a lot harder because that's deeper. It's deeper into someone's emotional DNA. But the biggest technique in all of this is A, understanding the architecture of it. B, something I call, and write about in my new book, something called multiple truths. We want one thing to be true. He's a bad guy. He's not, he not, he not always a bad guy. And people at work actually kind of think he's a nice guy. And then he bailed out the neighbor who had a broken hip. And then he did help your sister, but then he cheated on you, but then he was nice to your kid, but then he did. You see, 
This idea of the narcissistic person as a simple, one-dimensional cartoon villain is just not real. I wish it was. It would make it, would make it so much easier. But people are like, they were really nice to my mom when she was sick, and they're cheating on me, and they screamed at me, and, and, and they're just like, and I, and I say to them, Let's think, think of this as a stack of pancakes. Thing after thing after thing, they're all true. And in the end of it, though, it's not good for you because their cruel and validating behavior, that's the checkmate and that's never acceptable. And a person can be nice to your sick parent and be cruel to you. And that cruelty to you is taking a toll. And if you're staying because they're nice to your mother, simultaneously you need to recognize it's not okay if someone treats you badly and that you do not need to get your identity from that. You have to be very clear, like, okay, I need the support with my parent right now. This thing that's happening is in the relationship is bad. I need to disconnect from this. I need to disengage from this. I, I have to recognize this is not good for me. Mm. It's that. It, it, and it, is that easy? No, absolutely not. How do you do that thing? I know you said that it's not easy, but because if you're living in the same house as somebody, and you've decided, I'm going to stay in this relationship, I've got my reasons, mm. we've just done everything that you've just said, they understand the identity thing, and I'm just projecting, I'm thinking about myself living in that house, I would feel like, okay, I know what they're like, I know that they can maybe erupt, I know that they're, you know, um, their tendencies, but then I would live on, like, on tiptoes. If you're living with someone that you have to be on tiptoes, always worried about if they're going to erupt, how do you Do you live? have to be on tiptoes? And as long, again, I'm taking violence out of this because yes, it of muddies course. the yes, waters, right? Yes, yes, So they yell, it ain't about you, it's about them. And they want a tantrum like a three-year-old, get up and go to another room, mm. take a walk, like let them have their tantrum. What do we do with a tantruming three-year-old? We don't engage with them. We're like, you work this out, you make sure the child's safe. But I, I can't tell you how many times I drank a cup of tea and watched my child flail on the ground <laughs> until she worked it out, read a, read, read a book. She had to get it out and then she was done. And then I'm like, how are you doing? This, except the difference in narcissists, you wouldn't even ask them how you doing. Yeah. So they rage. It's not about you. It's not personal. It's who they are. They are a tantruming child. So maybe you can, the eggshells come from, honestly, the eggshells come from the idea that you think you can do something about this. I'm telling you there's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. So why are you walking on eggshells? Live your life. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I heard a video that you did where <laughs> it was actually really funny because you're giving these things of like, look, this is how you get under a narcissist's skin. Mm -hmm. But I'm not telling you so you can go and get no, under their skin. But this is how it happens. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I think you, you call it the framework of what is going to set them mm -hmm. off. Now, mm -hmm. even um, as with what we're talking about, knowing the framework, I worry that I would inevitably slip into the, the pattern, right? Because I think a couple of them you say is like, they hate it when you're blase. They hate it when you, mm -hmm. um, you know, you kind of take your own time or that you're center of attention. Like all these things that really are going mm -hmm. to set them off. Mm -hmm. If I knew that, if I'd chosen to stay in this relationship, mm -hmm. I worry that I would like, mm -hmm. oh my God, yeah. I can't be center of attention because that's going to set them off. Correct. So here's where we talk about that splitting off your identity. Part of radical acceptance is being okay with them being set off. Mm. Does that make sense? Now, nobody out there welcomes rage. People who have had histories of trauma, histories of growing up in very verbally violent households, that presence of yelling and conflict, I, I, I'll own it very personally for myself. I'm somebody who gets very scared when, I, when someone's even like, let's say people, we were in a place and there were two people over there yelling at each other and it had nothing to do with me. I would not be able to pay attention to you anymore mm. because that's a, that's a, um, it sort of, it plucks my guitar screen, it, string. It sort of, it leaves me rattled. And that's because of my own histories with verbal, verbal violence. Mm. So you're absolutely right, Lisa, that a person who has that sort of wired traumatic history, wired emotional history, where things like yelling or certain kinds of criticisms would feel very uncomfortable at almost a nervous system level, are almost going to unconsciously avoid those circumstances. Like, don't pay attention to me. Please, please don't pay attention to me because I don't want this guy to yell, not even because you even care anymore, but because it's emotionally rattling, okay? 
That's though when, that's why therapy becomes so important. Because then in the work of the therapy, it becomes, it could very well be that you start to learn, as long as I'm with this person, being the center of attention isn't worth the screaming. Hmm. Right? It's not. They'll say, so I'm not going to put myself in those circumstances. I'm going to avoid as much as I can going to social gatherings with them. I'm going to be a bit more like not bring up my stuff so anyone's complimenting me. I may not work, w invite them to events where I am the center of attention. Mm -hmm. But what that does mean too, and it's something where people can sort of take some of their power back, is to say, are there people in my life with whom I can be the center of attention and nothing bad will happen? So in other words, you have to cultivate healthy, seeing, recognizing human relationships, right? You're not getting it from that person. It, that's out. Then fine. So then it might be that you, and I've always said this to folks, if you're in a narcissistic relationship and you get good news, they are never the first person you tell ever. Because a lot of people think they see how cool I am. If they see this cool thing I did. Yeah. What then you think they're going to congratulate you? They're going to view you as a competitor. They're going to tear you down with contempt. They're going to leave you feeling bad about it. You never want to tell them first. You have your people, whoever they are. It could be a friend. It could be a sibling. It could be a colleague. Whoever it is. It could be a shrink. I can't tell you how many times as a shrink, I'm the first person they take. Doc, you're not going to believe this. Da -da. And I'm so happy for them. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm jumping out of my chair. I'm so proud of you. And they'll come back with me and say, you know, my whole life, this is what I would have wanted from my mom or my dad, and I get it from you. And, I, and I'll say there's grief in that, because that's where you deserved it from, but I want you to understand, you just filled another person with joy with something wonderful that happened to you. You slowly learn that people can see you. It may not be, be the people you wanted to have see you, mm -hmm. but it can be others. And then you cultivate that, and you take them your good news, and they're so proud of you, and you're like sort of smiling. And then after three, four, five of those encounters where someone's happy for you, then you tell the narcissist, and they're like, ugh, okay, fine, whatever. What is that? Like, yeah, okay, do we have to go to this thing? Like, psh. And then you know what? In your heart, those five other people are so proud of you. You're sort of like, oh, whatever. Mm. Oh, God, I love that. And so do you um, suggest that people would maybe write a list of the things that they feel like they need um, and then have that as like their cheat sheet. Cause I'm always trying to think about how I can, um, you know, my emotion is to go to the person that I'm with cause you want them to show the love and the pride. It's never going to happen. Right. So is it good to have a list of maybe the people to go to a certain mm -hmm. situation yeah, so that in that moment yeah. you don't revert back to thinking that your partner's going to do you know something You know what I'd suggest? Don't. I'd say go through your phone. Who are those five people? Mm. Fig figure out an emoji for those five people. It'd be whatever you want. It could be fire. It could be a heart, whatever. So what that means is, at least I know this on my, my iPhone, that let's say you have those five people, right? Then when you search their, you know, search your, con like you search uh, even on your contacts, your text, you put the little symbol and all those, those, those are the names are going to come up. And then you, you just sort of even paste, 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 because ah. you've got your people that, that makes it easier. And then you can get the word out to the people who are happy about you, happy for you. And I think that there is such a tremendous power for survivors when they're like, yeah, I'm not sharing this with this person because this is meaningful to me and I don't want them to ruin it. There's, there's a taking back. You know, some people say, isn't that a bummer you can't share with them? I'm like, no, that you know what they're going to say. So there's certainly a bummer and a grief that you're in this not so functional relationship. I understand that. But let the good things in your life still be good. Mm, I love that so much. Um, as we talk about relationships and, you know, really identifying because we've never spoken about what to do if you stay like we've never gone in this step mm -hmm. so i really love this it's the sort of thing that i've never necessarily thought about because i'm always just like how do we convince people to leave because that's you know get away from it but to your point i think you've really laid out beautifully mm -hmm. Um, the reasons why certain people don't. The shame thing is super freaking important because I assume that that's going to be something that if they decide to stay, that they feel shame maybe because they're looking at another mm -hmm. couple in another relationship. And so do they perceive that as maybe weakness on their part, do you think? And then does that tell them a story about themselves? So you're, you're so what you're suggesting is that when they feel shame about staying or falling for it, that they would have to, that they feel weak. Correct, mm -hmm. yes, but yeah. by comparing themselves to other people and other people's relationships. Ah, so comparison. Okay, so let's talk about comparison for a minute. 
There's, I had a fascinating conversation actually with a hair and makeup artist that was working with me the other day for something I was doing. And, you know, she said to me, it seems like there's two types of people in the world, people who get this narcissism thing and people who don't. I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's very terrible when the people who are in these relationships talk to the people who don't get it. Because more often than not, they're invalidated. Come on, it can't be that, that bad. This is your person. They talk nonsense, right? And I said, you kind of got to know who knows what, right? Mm -hmm. So that idea of comparison is so tricky. First of all, we never know what's under the hood of a relationship. We really, really don't. And what's fascinating as a shrink is I, you know, you, you get to look under the hood, mm -hmm. right? And I think, God, everybody must think these people are the golden couple. And this is a disaster, right? And then you see sort of this chaotic family that's got all these problems. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is a well-oiled, beautiful machine. So I think, first of all, nothing we see is true people who are proclaiming all this nonsense on social media are you it just it's not it is it is nonsense it's fiction right and so it's getting past that but then i think that people do feel shame they'll say this person isn't going through this and i'm staying in this what does this say about me uh, that's a very very common reaction and people don't know about this when they choose a partner that's a big part of pro part of the problem is as, and and what we're finding is that Everyone's like, well, the love bombing is only going to last six to 12 weeks. Shouldn't I have gotten out of this in three months? No, of course not. Because after those early three months of your relationship, now you've got all the equipment with which to build the justifications. And I actually do think it takes about a year to see a relationship as full on toxic, short of like you know, you're, you're dating someone and you're like, yeah, I'm not feeling it. I'm not talking about that. I'm like, people, someone's vibing with someone. You're feeling it. You're actually falling in love, but it's also unhealthy. Many people will want to, it'll take them a year before like, wow, this is just not okay. Mm -hmm. And heaven bless those who in the first year or two are like, this was just not shaping up cool. And they got out. And right? is that because the toxic narcissist person knows that they can't show all their cards at once and they finally show it after mm. a year? Like, what is that? One of the biggest fallacies is that relationships shouldn't be work. Say what? Say what? We put time, effort and hard work into growing our careers or our business, but love should just happen? After 20 years of being married, all stars were being willing to ask and answer hard questions. I have a free downloadable PDF for you for a happy, successful, lasting love. Click the link below for free access to the most important questions you must ask your partner, PDF. It's not a conscious process with the narcissistic mm. people. I think that the whole idea that they're sitting like, right. <laughs> oh, okay, it's 12 weeks in, yeah. I could be a jerk now. Right. They've always kind of been a jerk. I mean, narcissistic people are all about appearances. They're very good at the superficial, showing up, looking just great and, and knowing what people want to see. But when things start to fall apart, it's not because they're like, well, now I can take you for granted. Mm. It's not a conscious process. But what's happening is, is that in some ways, some of their defenses are loosening, like some of the things that keep them looking good to the world. And if they think they've got you locked down, your narcissistic supply, your compliments, your novelty is starting to wear off. Mm -hmm. So you're not as, you're like a stale piece of bread. It'll still do in a pinch if I'm hungry, but it's definitely not what I'm going for first. And that's what you become. You become a stale piece of bread. So you may have this relationship and what's happening is it's three months in, right? Life is happening, right? And you might have more stress at work. You may not be like for, you might say, oh, I'm a huge deadline. So for the next month, I'm going to have to work late or I can't do this or I may not be able to do that. Well, now you're not the mm. perfect source of narcissistic supply. Again, life starts getting in the way. A lot of people say those first six weeks, like I was moving things around to make things work. I wanted to see them so much. It was so exciting. La, 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 la. I mean, unless you really are a very sort of charmed life person, life happens. Mm. And when life happens, healthy people like, yeah, I kind of got to be at work at time. I can't lie in this bed and call in sick again. And when that happens, you've punctured the fantasy for the narcissistic person. You've inconvenienced them or left them feeling not special. And that's where the cracks are going to show. And then you're working out you're like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know what? Like I'll figure it out and we'll have a great time this Saturday. And you do have a great time Saturday. Like, ooh, 
okay, I just made it be great. And then, but you see that push pull, mm -hmm. it takes about a year to figure that out. And I can see just as you laid that out, how much that kind of can water us down. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then at that year mark, then how, if we don't then maybe identify, wow, I've been watered down, then that's where your needs go to die. I've heard the quote that you say, like a narcissistic relationship is where people's needs go to die. Mm -hmm. And so is that it after the one year, as if you keep going, then your mm -hmm. needs are just going to get, um, get obliterated. Yeah, so in a person paying attention will say, uh, this doesn't feel good and like it's, I can't keep up with their demands. And there's a couple of, th many things then have to also be lining up. Lisa, if a person, and I see this happening more and more, especially for people who want children, they'll say, oh, I'm 35, I want a child, oh, maybe it's not that bad, you know, and I'm saying, I got two words for you, reproductive technology. Have this kid on your own. You would be better off not raising them in this kind of a toxic mm. space. And so I have to say that th that has changed the game. I have talked to five women in the last year who have said enough. I am 36 and I'm over this and I refuse to ever have a custody battle or have someone take what's already going to be a hard journey and they're having children on their own and they're like and if somebody wants to date me as a single mom great I'm going to weed out the suckers mm -hmm. but now at least I know I'm not raising my child and I didn't relent and give in to a really really unhealthy relationship it's a it's I am I, more and more women are stepping up in that way and actually not as many men but some men are I know a couple of men have said I've just I've really dated a bunch of really unsettling women, but I want to be a father. They find a surrogate, their sperm, egg they choose, baby. Wow. And they're wonderful single dads. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Actually, as you were talking, maybe you can um, uh, like demolish this idea that I have, but every time, so when we do these episodes, I love it so much. The feedback is amazing. It's usually about, I've left my partner, yeah. thank you. But now there's a lot of people speaking up about narcissistic mothers oh, yeah. and they want to know how mm. to deal with their narcissistic mother. Now, here's the first question that I just have just selfishly. Why is it I'm hearing so much about male narcissistic partners, but I also always hear a lot about female narcissistic mothers? I'm, I'm so glad you picked that up because everyone's like, aren't all narcissist men? And I'm like, no, because how many of you have narcissistic mothers? Raise your hands, right? right? So clearly not. Um, what we do know is that there are grandiose narcissism, malignant narcissism, much more prevalent in men. Vulnerable narcissists, the more resentful, sullen, manipulative, passive aggressive, that's women. You know, and in many ways, women are not socialized to have those big kind of explosive, look at me, I'm so great kind of traits, though some do. So it is obviously in both, and they're obviously women who are narcissistic, and it's, you know, it's naive to assert otherwise. And so there are narcissistic mothers actually are very impactful because in still the majority of family settings, I think this is evening out in some situations, but certainly not all, women are often, mothers are often a primary caregiver. So they're impactful in terms of their lack of emotional availability and their inconsistency and their cruel barbs and their passive aggression and their superficial needs for their kids to be exactly what they want as basically glorified accessories. That messes a kid up. A lot because they're really looking to the mom oftentimes like a, disproportionately they want their mom to be the soft place to land yeah i've got and then i've heard you say that you know the, the child really just starts to question am i enough or like why am i not yeah enough? exactly why am i not enough and then how does that then so take me through that like how does that have that knock-on effect on the child from the mother's or the parent's behavior and then how does that start to echo as the person gets into an ad adulthood mm -hmm. and do they end up mirroring that in the partner they choose mm -hmm. yeah i mean a classical representation so when we Keep in mind, not everybody who ends up in an adult narcissistic relationship originated from a narcissistic family system. It's not the case. Some mm. people actually come from really happy families and they meet this charming, charismatic person and they fall in love and they're like, what? And that, that's a different story. But quite commonly, if a child grows up with a narcissistic parent, the narcissistic parent's needs take primacy. They're the only needs that are accounted for, mm. right? And the narcissistic parent, in a way, resents the child for having needs other than theirs, as though it's again, it's a coffee machine, right? That talks to you like, really? And the child internalizes that parent's sense of subtle resentment for their needs and starts feeling like I need to make myself smaller and smaller so I don't aggravate this parent. The child also learns that their relationship with their parent is quite transactional. 
that there are ways to win this parent over. Look a certain way, do a certain activity, behave a certain way, be perfect, uh, be a great student, um, don't be seen, don't make noise. And so the child, in the more extreme cases, can almost become obsessive and compulsive because these things, this high level of control, gives, lets them feel a sense of control over this parental relationship and maybe I can win them over mm -hmm. for the rest of their lives. They will then wonder, what do I need to do to win this other person over? They learn that their needs will be shamed. So there's never a safe sense that I can express these needs. And if I do express them, I'm either going to lose the other person or the other person's going to rage at me. Those are not nice options. So you don't express your needs. Everything is about the parent. It was the parent's interest. So the child may desperately try to take on the parent's interests. You know, saying, like, okay, maybe if I could learn to like this, then I can do this thing with the parent, right? So slowly but surely, the child is shaving away anything that's truly and natively theirs and becoming and morphing and subjugating themselves under everything that that parent wants. But what that does is it thwarts the child's development of identity and of self. Not to mention that the parent's also very manipulative. Again, they're, they're really using the child as a means of getting their needs met. So as that child catapults into adulthood, they may, in most cases, will be very anxious in relationships, try to win people over, feel their needs don't have a space, and subjugate their identity under the new partner. Every so often, if I, if I would pull a number out of the air, 10, 15% of the people who grow up like that become narcissistic themselves. Hmm, that was mm -hmm. actually what I was going to ask. Mm -hmm. Is it the kind of, you know, you become it yourself? You can in some cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not genetics? Mm -mm. No, mm -mm. no, not at all. In fact, you look in a family, it's very interesting actually, because I've worked with, you know, families where there's four siblings and and, and I'll be, in fact, I might be working even with the parent of the adult children. And the parent will say, I have one ragingly narcissistic kid and the other three are just great. So, and they were kind of raised the same. Mm. And one thing we do know is something called temperament makes a difference. And temperament is sort of our inborn personality. You look back at the child and you'll see as a baby, maybe they're just sort of a little bit more difficult, fussy, more difficult to soothe. As they came into childhood, they were more attention seeking, more inattentive, more disruptive. Um tantrum-y, difficult. They're difficult kids. The tough thing with difficult kids is the world doesn't like them. Even their parents don't really like them because they're always, you know, they're not sweet. They're mm -hmm. just sort of like, look at me, look at me, pay attention to me. And the parents will burn out as we'd expect. I'm not even mad at the parents for that. Um, they may not know how to manage them well. And they find, they find it hard to set limits with them because they have to do it repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Whereas with an other child, it might be once or twice and the kid's getting it. So that kid with that really difficult temperament gets lots of negative feedback from the world, not just from parents, but from preschool teachers, kindergarten teachers up into primary school. So what is this child learning? You're no good. You're bad. It, be, it, it can breed a real sense of insecurity, lack of safety. Fast, add a couple of other ingredients. Fast forward, you've got a narcissistic adult. Wow. Almost every narcissistic adult I know where I've been privy to getting an objective look at their history, access to a parent or something, mm. sibling, in almost every single case, someone who knew them as a child said, this kid was a freaking handful. Like just it, really not a, like not a fun kid, not a nice kid. Um, not, or not even not even they were a nice kid. It was they were a difficult kid. Sometimes a very charming kid. They're like when this kid was like kept it together, everyone was charmed by them. But it was just like they were they were sucking all the energy to, on the, this one kid and, and parents have said this siblings have said this that this was the tough sibling this was the mm. tougher child and when i work it backwards on, on like i said it's a luxury when i am able to talk to um sometimes they'll even bring in video they'll say this is my narcissistic brother as a kid and you're like what mm. you know and i've had narcissistic clients who've shown me video from their kids and you guys all it was all there it was all there. So if it's not genetic, then can the parent do something different mm -hmm. when their kid's freaking out and all of this to help them not become a narcissist in the future? Yeah, because I think that, you know, it's, parenting is a long game, right? I think that it's not, I mean, I think that that's what's so hard about parenting, right? We we want to do something once and have it be done. And parenting is like you, you, you knock the whole tower down every night and you have to build it up mm -hmm. again the next day. And it's decades and decades of that, right? And if you have anything else going on in your life, I mean, and here's the thing, this is why parenting is so challenging. 
People bring all kinds of their own stuff into parenting, their own mental health histories, their own trauma histories, their own busyness, their own stress, their marital problems, their work problems. It's hard to have all that going on and be on point with a little person. It really, really is. I don't think we talk enough about how difficult parenting is and instead we criticize parents all the time or we give them the absolutely most ridiculous advice in the world mm -hmm. that, so parents can't win. So all of that said though, that it is, what do you do with that child who's having that moment? It is about, it's about consistency. It's about routine. It's about predictability. It is about empathy. It's about tone. It's about presence. It's about mindfulness. And what does that all require? That the parents got their stuff together. Mm. And I say this as a parent, it was not easy. I made, I mean, I could write a five volume book on the number of mistakes I made. Nothing but mistakes. And, and I did a lot of things right too. And each generation, hopefully we do a little bit better than the one before. As you were talking, help me then put a couple of things together because if it's not genetics and they become an adult and they are a narcissist, how come then you cannot change them? Because I've heard you say narcissists are like the weather. You, you just can't change mm -hmm. the weather, so you have mm -hmm. to accept mm -hmm. them. How then is it not a behavior that can be unwired? Because the person doesn't want to change it. And so you're saying that a narcissist in and of itself, they don't want to change, and so that's why they can't change. Mm -hmm. So it's purely because the narcissist can't see that they should. should right, they, have, they, they have no self-awareness. Whoa! I've heard you like talk about narcissism mm -hmm. and why they can't mm -hmm. like that. Just really hit yeah, me. Yeah, they don't have any self-awareness. So it's that piece yeah. that they don't want to. Not that it's self-awareness. It is uh, lack of self-awareness. It's lack of empathy. It's entitlement. It's a it's a stuntedness. Mm. You know, it's a real immaturity mm. to narcissistic people. Um, but they can't be bothered. I'm blaming if you're. Uh, you know why I'm having a problem? It's your fault, Lisa. Mm. Do you know why there was traffic today? Because you scheduled this interview at this time. That's why I was late. It's your fault. Why couldn't you have scheduled it at a different time? Instead of, Romani, why didn't you leave on time? I'm not going to take responsibility for that. It's Lisa's fault. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. Mm. It's the TV's fault. It's the, it's the social media's fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my shrink's fault. It's my teacher's fault. It's everyone. So if you're always doing that, and if a therapist, if a therapist tries to, shh, come on, take some responsibility, you know what that narcissistic client might do? Not show up the next week. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear that from you. And you know what? If you got enough money, you'll find someone you can pay to tell you what you want to hear. You're right. It is Lisa's fault. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was so powerful. Okay, so let's go back to actually the parents because this is really interesting and I know my audience really want to hear from you about how to deal with those situations when you have maybe a narcissistic parent. Um, walking away obviously is an option. Some, for some people it is. For some people. Mm -hmm. It is um, an option for some, it isn't an option for others. I've heard you say though the thing that gets a lot of us trapped is the notion of like blood is thicker than water and you only Sometimes. have one mother. and Yeah, I mean that's, that stuff is... It's ancient, and that ancient stuff has done a lot of harm. Mm. It's a really interesting thing, Lisa, because this idea of estrangement, familial estrangement, families that are cut apart and don't talk with each other, has become sort of a bit of a hot button issue in mental health in the last 10 to 15, 20 years. There's one camp that says all estrangement is bad. I ain't buying that. I was reading a woman's book recently, this woman named Stephanie Fu, and she was on my podcast, and she wrote a book on her experience of complex trauma. And she, and as part of her journey in this book and everything, she, she talks to some journalists and some researchers who talked about estrangement. There was something so smart in her book. She said that nobody out there wants to be estranged from their family. Nobody's like, yay, I'm estranged from my family. I feel so much better. They say, this is devastating. I'm estranged from my family. However, it was destroying me to remain in touch with them. So it's that ability to have that point of, it's not like I'm going to cut them off and I'm going to teach them or it, nobody, it, when done correctly, this process of estrangement is one where a person has said, I am starting to completely lose myself. 
that they cut themselves off. And I think estrangement's on a continuum. I mean, I think there are some people who go fully no contact. They're mm -hmm. like, I, my, I'm, I have nothing to further to do with my parents. They were never able to take responsibility or accountability. It is harming me to be in touch with them, and they're out, and I fully respect that. Then there are people, I call them, they sort of, they're physically present with their families, but they've almost become, I call it almost soul estranged. Mm -hmm. Their soul is estranged. They, have like, they said, I, I've, these are people who, if in any other world universe, I would have nothing to do with these people. I find them to be absolutely awful people. I'm embarrassed that this is my family. However, there's a cousin here I like, there's a grandparent I like, and I, I don't, I'm not going to upend the whole system but I can't stand them. And so they'll go as infrequently as they can. They won't have meaningful conversations. They won't share that much. They won't share their lives. They won't share their accomplishments. They've learned to put that barrier there, right? That's its own form of estrangement, right? Because they're really not in it with the family and they really avoid them at every cost. So it's, again, it's on a continuum. But a lot of people say, I want to find a balance. And the challenge with parents is when we're with them, we shrink down into children again. And it's how to bring your adult self into that relationship with this person who may trigger tremendous feelings of inadequacy. That I've had clients say, I'm going through the world and I'm on it and I'm running my business and I'm killing it and I'm doing it. And then I see my parents and I become the most insecure. So like my parents are like kryptonite. They're like I go from being this really successful, strong person in the world into this trembling leaf. Why would you want to be with that, right? And they're like, I want to figure that out. And you know, that depends on the nature of the relationship. Therapy, trauma-informed therapy. Some people do, you know, therapeutic work like called internal family systems. Like they figure out how you've internalized this whole dysfunctional system and it continues to harm you. And then there's a point, and I've seen it happen, Lisa, I've seen it happen, so I know it can happen, when a person's able to say, this is what I came from, it is a mess, I am not defined by these people, I will show up as my authentic self, and if these people disrespect me, I'm going to turn around and leave. Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk out the door and say, bye, I got to go. Not mean, not, not, I'm out of here, nothing like that, but... When you sense that, that they, are, they cannot see you and they're going to disrespect you, they give themselves permission to leave. And they really, and they say, but however, like I remember one woman telling me, and I write about this in the new book too, is how she said her mother was so cruel to her her whole life. Her whole life. She comes into adulthood. A couple of her siblings had passed, so it was just her. Her mom was sort of in a substandard situation, like nursing situation, whatever. Her mother's like, you know, you're just a useless daughter. And the, the woman had a job, a career and all that. You're a useless daughter. You don't help me, this, that. And the daughter thought, I'd be well within my rights to walk away from this situation. The substandardness didn't mean her mom's being abused, but it really wasn't. Like, she wasn't getting healthy food. Like, it was just not good. So she invested the money to get a better setup for her mom, but it required her to go and check in and check and make sure that the system she created was working. And she did. And she put a lot of her money and she put herself into it and checked, made sure, calibrated the people working it, made sure her mom like, wasn't getting like you know sores on her body, whatever. And when I asked her, why'd you do it? Because every time this woman showed up, like, you B word, you know, you just left me. Like, you, you, you know what? These people working, they're stupid and on and on and on and on. And I said, you know, with what you've set up, it's gonna, it'll last you. Why don't you hire someone to oversee it? No. She said, you know what? This mother of mine left me feeling my whole life that I was a monster, that I lacked all compassion, that I was a terrible person. And she grained that into me. She said, I spent my whole adult life thinking that. And I did the work. I did trauma therapy. I worked with great therapists. I did the work. And I'm not a bad person. I'm actually a deeply compassionate person. And she said, I will be damned if this woman on her deathbed, by me feeling that the only way I can make my point is walking away, that I am going to be compassionate to the end. I, she's like, I wouldn't engage with her. She'd say, my mom would talk to me. I would ignore it. But she said, this was my mother. My bad luck was this is the person I got assigned to. And, but I will see this through. And when she passes, I will know with whatever dignity in terms of her care was seen, 
And she said, and then I'll quickly throw together a funeral and I'll be relieved as hell when she's dead. Mm. That's the honesty. And that's what people, if they could get to that, she said, I wasn't going to let her rush. She said, that was an, she said it was an unkind thing to leave this woman sitting in her own filth half the time. Mm. I'm not doing it. She, she said she kind of deserves it, but I'm not doing it because that's not who I am. It's not about her. It's about me. It's about how I think human beings deserve to be treated. It's about how I think a person could step up. But it's not about, it's, and yes, it will result in her being comfortable, but I'm not trying to get her approval. Mm. Wow. What's the difference in, in those situations? How could you um, process it to make sure that you're doing it because, okay, this is how I want to feel and this is about me, not about them, versus the guilt mm -hmm. aspect of like, well, God, mm -hmm. I can't let my mom rot by herself in the home. Like that, that makes me a bad daughter. Even if you've been treated badly, it's the guilt that makes right. you go back. So it's the, if, if somebody said to me, said, I'm a bad daughter, I'd be like, nope, go backwards. Let's say that again. You are, because you said you're a bad daughter. So that was the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go back so you can say it the right way. It's, it's, it is about intention. It's about leaning into it. It's about recognizing that you're never going to fully strain the guilt out of this, right? Never. Mm. But you can be somewhat intentional, right? Because in a way, especially as a narcissistic parent gets older, they're pitiful. They're pitiful people. And people feel sorry for them, right? I'm like, I, I said, and I'll say to them, it's okay to feel sorry for them. They're, they're pitiful. They're absolutely pitiful, okay? you're not responsible for that and it's helping them pull the it, to to be able to sign again the stack of pancakes mm -hmm. simultaneously say this is so pathetic this person what their life is that they sit here they talk angrily to the television or whatever yep it is that is true they are pitiful and i feel guilty about that you know then we have to break that did you cause that are you responsible for why they talk to their television no but so it's that take, and that's what people who've had narcissistic parents do. They take responsibility for things that are not theirs. And so I almost view the therapy then as almost like you threw a bunch of blocks on the floor. I'm like, can we now separate the red blocks from the green blocks from mm -hmm. the blue blocks? It's like, can we separate all this stuff out so you can see what's theirs and what's yours? I like that block analogy. Mm -hmm. That's really good. And then the pancake thing actually really did make sense because I think we often get trapped in one narrative. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And this is very, all these things are true and that's what makes it complicated. And they can all sign, because I think we want it to all be bad. See, they're so terrible, they're so terrible. That's why so many people who are in narcissistic relationships says, I hope they hit me. I hope they cheat mm -hmm. on me because then I'll have a reason to leave. I'm like, but them emotionally abusing you, criticizing you, lying to you, doubting your dreams, pissing on your aspirations, that's not a reason to leave you. But having a little, you know, having an inappropriate relationship on a one night stand in Vegas, that's the grounds for leaving. That's a legitimate reason to leave. And all this other stuff, which is far more legitimate, they're eating up your soul, not legitimate. Why? 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 That's how our society regards it. Oh, come on. All relationships are hard. Oh, really? Like, oh, what does that mean? They're shaving away your soul. Oh, oh come on. Everyone criticizes people, mm. but like, oh, well, he. He banged a waitress in the back of the car. You leave him. I see people who are sweet people who make the mistake, right? They get drunk. They kiss the stripper. I don't know what they do. It's <laughs> not the circles I go in. But, but they're a really nice person. Like, and, they, and they'll come home and say, I can't believe I got caught up in the moment. And I'm, I'm going to therapy and I'm going to do the work and la, la, la. You got a better chance with the back seat backseat blowjob guy <laughs> than you're gonna have with a narcissistic person who's cutting you down dude this is so strong this is so powerful i never thought of it like that oh my god how much it's the society that we have bought into the mm -hmm. belief of yeah. what is a reason quote unquote to leave a relationship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So there's things that are legitimized, like oh, she left because he cheated. You're my hero, girl. You go. Yeah. But if she said, I left because I was chronically invalidated and devalued and gaslighted, I'm like, I don't know, maybe I need to go on a couple's therapy. But he bought you flowers. But he, he bought took you, you flowers oh, wow. and he's trying to make it up and he said, bought you a ticket to Hawaii. And I'm like, okay, so she's been invalidated for 15 years. And a Mai Tai is supposed to make this better? I don't think so.
So actually speaking about invalidation, I freaking love when you talk about the invalidation game, where if you know you're going to be in an environment with somebody who's going to invalidate you, mm. maybe do a point system where if they invalidate you five times, you're now, you you owe yourself an ice cream. Uh, and so like giving yeah. the, the, the plus. Turning it into a game. Yeah. Turn, like I think that th there's a couple of things too there though. It's turning it into a game like came out of actually something I had done once at an event where that happened. And so it became a game. I was cause, And I was almost like earning points. I'm like, if they invalidate me two more times, then I can actually get a milkshake. So I'm like, yeah, you don't know. So they're like, they actually, it was, they must have thought I was gone off the deep end because I was, you know, saying when they finally did the fifth invalidation, I was thinking, oh my gosh, on my way home, I'm stopping the place, I'm gonna get the milk. So I looked very cheerful. I looked super cheerful because I was gonna get this thing I never get myself. So you were right? at an event? Yeah, I was at I was at a gathering of people. Do you mind explaining? That? It was just like basically it was a gathering of people. There's someone there who's traditionally just sort of been a, eh, 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 and like oh yeah, I was like, do you really think that's true? And like oh come on, that just sounds like a waste of time and money. Like it was just all these digs, and the problem was other people at the event were asking me. Some, something about something I was doing. Mm. And I knew the invalidator was there. Typically, going back to something we talked about earlier in our conversation, my stance has often been, if I knew I was gonna be around this person, I would actually avoid him being in a conversation where other people were hearing these nice things being said about me because I didn't want to deal with it. But I couldn't avoid it, so I'm like, I've got to turn this into a game or I'm going to completely, you know, it's going to just be too jarring. And and then it happened again, I, and then I tried it again another time, and it was the same thing. Like, how many times is this person going to say something dismissive, contemptuous, invalidating? And so I'm almost smiling, right? Because I'm thinking, like, it's like, it's you know, back when I was a kid, there were these things called green stamps. You could collect them and turn them in for like household items. And I'm like, well, if I get like five more, I can get a sewing machine. You know, I'm thinking like, or it's like frequent flyer miles. That's yeah. what people are gonna buy. Okay, if I get another hundred frequent flyer miles, I can go to Paris. So I'm thinking, I'm a kind of cheerful as this is happening. I, I don't wanna be flippant because I think people are hearing that like, oh gosh, if I'm being invalidated, that doesn't feel good. But the, the idea of being more narcissist resistant is that you understand what you're going into, if that makes sense, right? And so if I know this person, people are gonna be there, and I know what the circumstance is, and da 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 da, I can gird myself a little more so I don't feel completely caught off guard, mm -hmm. right? Where if I go in and think everyone's gonna be so happy for me here, and then I start getting these invalidating comments, I might be a bit rattled, sad, and thrown off. But if I'm prepared, it's almost like going into a like if I'm going into a, when I was back in school at a difficult exam, I knew what I was going into. If I didn't prepare, I would have been, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but if I was well prepared, it'd still be difficult, but I would get through it because I had prepared for the test. Mm -hmm. It is like preparing for a test. And so I think being prepared at some level, like sitting with yourself and saying, okay, this person's gonna invalidate me. Maybe I can sort of get through the room in a different way. I could avoid these topics. You can prepare for these interactions. Mm -hmm. And then when they do, do their, what they do, invalidate whatever the heck they do, you're thinking to yourself, of course they did. You know, that's what they do instead of, oh, I suck because they thought, they said I'm not this and I'm dumb and I shouldn't be doing that. It's not gonna work every time. Their days were more vulnerable. There's things we're more vulnerable about, but we can catch ourselves. And I think the more we stop and say, I don't feel good right now, what is happening? We can take, we can be self-reflective and say, oh, I see what's happening. This is bringing up a feeling of ostracism from the past. This is bringing up a feeling of foolishness in the past. This is bringing up how it felt like when my father criticized me in the past. Like people can start identifying and recognize that person sitting across from me is not my father and I am not six. And I actually don't really like this person. And I can figure out a way to detach, mm -hmm. either literally, physically, get up, leave, or change the subject. Or in some cases, I even tell some folks, kind of do a, it almost sounds like a forced dissociation, but let's say I was bothered by you and you were, we were at a party and we're sitting on couches mm -hmm. like this and you were going on about something nonsensical and it was leaving me feeling bad and criticized. You're like saying, well, let me tell you about how I raise my kids and I don't think people should do that. And it just felt uncomfortable to me. I would actually start describing the area around you. And so while you're talking, it would be like two velvet pink pillows flanked her as she sat in her 
black boots and pants, which quilt, you know, I would literally start mm. describing the scene. So now you are Assuming like, your head. Mah, 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 mah. and I'm being polite and I'm like, and I'm looking at everything and I'm like, and the fluffy pillows that resembled a Persian cat. So now I'm kind of, now I'm sort of like seeming like I'm really <laughs> listening to you, but I'm also bringing down my anxiety. Oh, I love that. And that was actually why I wanted to bring up that invalidation game mm -hmm. is because in these moments where maybe people are yeah, just feeling like, something to hold yeah, where to. you feel so mm -hmm. knotted up yeah. and like, I'm just like, what are the things they can go to in, in those time. moments? Yeah. And then mm -hmm. even just talking about family, if you're in a situation where let's say you have a narcissistic mother, mm -hmm. but you still want to go to family gatherings because you love your of sister, course. you or love your, your grandmother, brother, whatever, grand yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. In those situations, I'm only going to like think about myself that I would be, get anxious about being around my mom, which is going to make me not enjoy the event, yeah. which is not going to make me connect to my mm -hmm. sister, to mm -hmm. all the people I want to be mm -hmm. around. So in thinking about what tools can I use in those moments mm -hmm. where I still want to go, I know I'm about to mm -hmm. have these comments hit me, and I know what that, how it makes me feel, mm -hmm. how do I have a different tactic? And so mm -hmm. the validation, invalidation thing was so genius, especially because you were like, and I'm going to buy myself an ice cream. Right, or, or, whatever. Like, or even something silly things yeah. like, okay, now I'm actually going to let myself get that extra thing at Target, or I'm going to buy yeah. a book, or all kinds of, you know, or I'm going to let myself watch a half hour of TV. Like, it was really a reward mechanism. But what it did was it lightened my mood. Mm -hmm. And then that lightening of my mood actually sends a signal to my entire nervous system of like, we be chilling. We good mm -hmm. instead of like like that you know it's a very different thing and those kinds of mm, then when it's happening i think one of the things that throws people off in this situation because i was thinking about a recent scenario i'd gone through it was a workplace situation and it sometimes people doubt their judgments They're like maybe i'm reading this wrong maybe i and that's what, very common in survivors of narcissistic abuse even when they're being invalidated think maybe i'm making too big a deal maybe i'm the problem it's that again that self-doubt and self-blame it's really hard to give yourself permission for something that doesn't feel good. Imagine you're at a big dinner, okay? And there's all this food on the table. Everyone's focused on this one dish. Everyone's got to have tried it. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, this is the best. I'm, oh, this is so good. And you eat it and you're like, I don't like this, right? And I, I very, I remember it happening once, like people gave me this, this chocolate and I, I almost looked like a little kid. I was like, this is disgusting. <laughs> like, isn't this the best raw chocolate you've ever had? I'm like, oh my God, like someone find me a Hershey bar. This is gross. And the thing is though, most of us, and even in that scenario, I was actually thinking someone get me a Hershey bar and I was trying to find a way to like, I'm <laughs> pretending to sneeze. So I could spit the chocolate out. <laughs> and so, but we in those circumstances, everyone's enjoying the dish or enjoying the, whatever that thing that gave me to eat was. You think, I can't be the only one who's wrong. It's very hard. And one of the challenges is, is that so many people are like, we can all find a way to get along with everyone. And there are no toxic people. And you shouldn't say that. And all that sunny nonsense pay a trust this body of yours it's just like this beautiful honest thing that walks around the world with you and you let your brain i mean i think your brain kind of has the best seat in the house but your body's actually doing more of the work for mm -hmm. you and so if it doesn't feel good in your body stop and ask yourself this isn't gonna lie to me something's happening right now i must trust this this thing's holding all my pain things holding my memories in a very different way because your what your brain does with a memory is it's almost like photoshop mm -hmm. it read it's a memory to make it sort of workable but your body's like no girl you really did look that bad and we are not <laughs> fixing this picture <laughs> so it's there's a truth here mm -hmm. so and i think of this workplace thing was like for a long time this person had bothered me from the first time i met them Everyone else is saying they're great. You're going to have to make this work. I'm like, okay, I'm going to need to be a grown up. But I literally felt sick. And I felt so sick when I had to interact with this person. I'd actually cause some of the wheels to come off the train because without that collaboration, mm -hmm. I was actually taking on 200% of the work myself, 200% more than I needed to do. And I was exhausting myself, but I was doing anything I could to avoid the terrible person. It was almost 14 months before anyone would fess up to, yeah, she's actually a really awful person. Because at work, especially, we have to play nice. We can't say, don't you think that person's a jerk? Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm like, hey, 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 like, let's be respectful in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I get that. We have to be respectful. We can trust our bodies. And in that particular case, it was a confusing workplace situation. But my body didn't lie to me from the jump. And when finally that person left, 
the job became a lot more it became a lot more pleasant i felt that too mm -hmm. so it is but all of this that's why everyone talks mindfulness 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 is actually that minute where you're like i don't like how this feels lisa i had a conversation with the person the other day i liked them well enough but like i didn't fully feel in my body while i was talking to them have you ever had that mm -hmm. experience where you just sort of like we're dancing are you're dancing like a salsa and i'm dancing a waltz and like mm -hmm. it's just nothing i'm doing is and there's weird pauses and and i had to pay attention to that and say this is not a she wasn't narcissistic she wasn't a bad person but my body is like nah. you know like whatever this is this is sort of a c-lister in your life not in a bad way but like you're not being natural something here there's a block and again, it's not an indictment of this person, but it was a moment where I could learn and not make it about me that there was something wrong with me. I'm like, something about the dance didn't work. Mm -hmm. we, try to, we try to dance two different dances, sometimes with a dance partner, and we just end up getting our feet stepped on. It doesn't mean you reject that person. It just might mean that you choose to interact with them in a different way. Wow. And is it because in that situation where you were saying you started to spot and everyone's like, oh, he's lovely. Mm -hmm. And you were like, mm -hmm. oh, something's not right. Is it the fact that we just want to fit in, yeah, that we it, just ignore is, the body it, sensations? Absolutely. And in fact, if you look at some interesting research, so there was a real push in research in the sort of the 1960s, post-World War II. The world was sort of shocked at how people could have conformed and obeyed to the such horrific human rights crises that happened during World War II, right? And so some of this was, there's interesting work by a guy named Solomon Ash. And I'm going to give you this, I'm actually probably not even going to present this the right way, but the long story short was in Solomon Ash's research, and we learn about this in every introductory psychology class, they'd show people three lines. One line is clearly longer than the other lines, right? So clear. And everyone's like, which is the longest? And there, you would have said the line B, I would have said line B, you would have said line B. Then there's like a person that the researcher kind of stuck in the group to say line A. And it's amazing how many people change their vote. Yeah. And with A, it was clearly shorter, yeah. right? So we are, we, this is why marketing works. If we didn't have that tendency to conform and shape, nobody could sell anyone to anything. Cause we're like, yeah, no, I, I, that doesn't work for me. Instead of like, you need this. Everyone else has one of these. Why don't you have one of these? Like, well, everyone else does have one. You don't stop to think, do I need that? Probably not, but everyone else has one. So how could I be the only one who's wrong? Our entire economic structure is based mm. on conformity. And do you think then that's why almost a narcissist is somewhat a sheep's in, uh, what is it? A wolf, well, a wolf in, sheep. in sheep's clothing. Yeah, yes. because mm -hmm. they show one side to people and it's like, oh my God, this is so lovely. And then they show you another side and you're, or you get the sense that you see the other side and other people only see one thing. And so right. they're saying, this person's amazing. You get this sensation that, hang on a minute, maybe something isn't right, right. but you ignore it. And you it. ignore it or you talk yourself out of it. Because everyone's saying he's charming. And especially, if, and they're charming, they're cool, they're amazing. Look at all these things they're doing. What's your problem? Get over yourself. Who knows what they'll say to you. And if you have a history of this in your life, of having been narcissistically abused, especially in childhood, self-doubt mm. is your first language. You're like, I, how, and it, it is that's why the body becomes a really important place to focus on because if you do it from up here all the rationalizations and all the old scripts just get, kick in instantly but if you say this doesn't something about this is just not feeling good let me sit with this for a minute um we just don't do that a lot and, mm -hmm. and we are very suspicious of people who do what up homie i got something free and new to share with you right now how often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I wanna teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. Okay, so you said something earlier, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I would love to hear you said like a C-level friend or C. You know, here, I talked about it. I have a video about it. I this. know. Yes. I was going to ask you. A, B, D, and C boundaries. D and F. Oh, yeah. D, oh, I this, go all the way down, girl. <laughs> let's, let's go. Okay, let's, so let's talk about our A's, B's, C's, D's, and F's. I think this is very useful. This came out of a couple of conversations. It was interesting. 
some of my, I did this with my clients and then this woman I met at an event, a woman had said like, yeah, I know, I kind of like level my friends up and down. And I thought, oh, how interesting. It was, it was so conform. And the reason I use A, B, D, and A, B, C, D, and F is because I used to be a professor. So I'm used to grading, right? And I think that what happens is we have people in our life and I wish everyone has some what I call a A's in their life. Your A's are the people where you be, you can be yourself. You don't feel like you have to keep everything buttoned up. You don't feel like you have to really censor yourself. You just show up as yourself, okay? That you know that if you called them at an odd time, like, can you talk? And it's all, and it's safe and it's good, right? But your A's may drop the ball, right? They, you know, you may have an experience with them where you don't feel safe, where they may be gaslighty, they may be manipulative, they, um, something about it stops feeling good. A lot of people say, oh, screw this friend. I'm like, I mean, it seems like you've had some things you like about them. Can you bring them to a B? Bs you might be a little bit more tentative, not that full you. You might hold back the vulnerable parts of yourself thinking these people are not responsible enough. You know, it's like, you, know, you might not, you don't always loan your car out to everybody, right? So it's a <laughs> psychological equivalent of not loaning your car out to them. So you hold some of yourself back. Your bees may screw up too even more. You might think, oh my gosh, like now you're getting dark. Like, this does not feel good. And then you can level them down to C's. The reason this is important is a lot of people are feeling like, whoa, as soon as I find out someone might be a little bit gaslighty or narcissistic, I got to get rid of them. I'm like, no, you they don't. Go straight you're to not going to have anybody in your life, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, an F would be mm -hmm. someone who really betrayed you, lied to you, betrayed your trust in a way that you're like, I can never trust this person again, right? And then I guess under an F is somebody you just completely removed from your life. But having that ability to say, you know, this, it's like, oh, I have to trust them. They're my good friend. They just did something that really betrayed your trust. And let's say you tried to talk to them about it, say, hey, what happened? And they deny and they deflect and they blame you saying, okay, this does not feel safe anymore. Bring them down to a B. You don't have to get rid of it. You might even take it from an A to a C. That's a drop. But it's a way of saying that just because you're sensing patterns in a relationship that leave you feeling uncomfortable, you can try to communicate about it. And if that doesn't change it, doesn't still mean you have to say, I'm out. It can say, they're here on a more limited basis. Mm. You know, I, they're, it's just, and I, they're not going to stay at my house for a week, but maybe we'll have one lunch. It's that. It's, it's a, it's, and you can then see that this isn't about throwing everyone out, but having enough self-respect to be able to move that, you know, move that boundary you need. And I know culturally this is hard for people. Some people say, it's my family. We're all supposed to be like, we're supposed to be open blah, blah, blah. It's how we, we do things in our culture. I get that. I came from that kind of a culture. And I say, you can still do it. You can still show up. And in your mind, I mean, as strange as it is, you can imagine there's an A, you can almost like little letters over their head. Like I'm going to go, oh, this cousin I trust fully and I'm all in and we're just in it and loving it. But then one of our C's comes in and the, the conversation may restrict you. Like you can imagine you're sitting on sofa, you're sitting with your cousin, you're yucking it up. And then the this, your, your sister comes in, you don't really, your sister you don't trust. And you're like, oh, hey, what are you guys talking about? Pfft, nothing. She was just showing me this new game on her phone. No, she wasn't. She was telling you something about her relationship. Like, she was showing me this new game on her phone. It's a silly thing. And, you know, oh, okay, well, you guys are laughing so much. Like, oh, I felt like I was three playing this game. And so now you, are you kind of being, I don't think you're being deceitful. I think you're protecting your cousin and your conversation where you were talking about something that you knew your sister would judge. Sister's still there. You're still at the family gathering, but you don't have, you can you see. And then another person may come in and you're even more careful. And then another A may come in and you're all now sitting together. We all do this. I don't think, I think people need to be aware you're already doing this. You are going through those fluid boundaries. It doesn't mean you have to give everyone up. And I think that's what's been getting contorted, honestly, Lisa, mm -hmm. in the TikTok of the narcissist world, and people are trying to simplify too much. Get out, girl. <laughs> Work away, girl. And I'm like, oh my God, a minute and a half does not get at the subtlety of, I had a history with them. They betrayed my trust. I'm not losing them, but I'm going to be careful with them, really careful. And that may not be as pithy, but I do think that people have to recognize that some people say, well, I don't want to be the sucker who keeps the toxic person around. No, you had a wake up call. Mm -hmm. You want them in your life, have them in your life, but be careful, be aware and catch yourself if you're justifying and self-blaming.
Oh God, I love that. And then also not to do it out of the punishment, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's not like I'm going to show them. So I'm going to take mm -hmm. them from an A to a C no. and see how they like it. It's based on what their behavior. It's based on how safe you felt with them. Yeah. It's based on, you know, you, you again, it's giving yourself permission to gauge your own safety mm -hmm. and make decisions accordingly. And I think the world pushes us to treat everyone like an A. Oh, that's actually really interesting. So why then do we are is our inclination to take someone from an A to an F if they've done one thing wrong? Is it out of self-preservation that you've opened yourself mm -hmm. up, you've trusted mm -hmm. this person and now they've done it so I can't ever trust them again? Mm -hmm. It's a black and white, right? That makes it so much simple. You did that, you're terrible, yeah. right? Versus they, th this person show me what they're capable of, right? It was a, um, I was working with a client recently and we were talking about that sense of like, when you show me something bad that you could do to me, you've now shown me what's in your behavioral repertoire. And the only th absolute in psychology is that past behavior predicts future behavior. So if you did that to me again, I would be naive as hell if I thought you couldn't do that to me again. Okay? So that's where we almost need to gauge things from like, ooh, you could do that to me, huh? Mm. Doesn't mean I need to reject you. Now this, per this person, this client said to me, why can't we, why, why shouldn't we be able to do the same on the good things they do? And I said, because the good things in some ways are easier for a person to fake, right? Like it's easier for a person to fake the good behavior. Hey, how are ya? Like, look, I brought you this, this beautiful fruit basket and I'm gonna come over and you're sick and blah, blah, blah. So that's almost easier. But the fact that you were able to stick it to me, that, 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 that almost feels like there was no regulation. I wasn't worth you catching yourself or you don't think this is bad. And that's a problem. So I, I know this sounds cynical, but in a way it's, you gotta make some of these judgments on the basis of the bad things someone's done to you. Mm. And if they showed a capability for them, some people say, well, hurt people hurt people. That's true. Then that means they're gonna hurt me again because they still a hurt person. So what then, and, I, and again, this gets this bigger philosophical issue of there's such an unwillingness to talk in an open way about narcissistic relationships and toxic behavior in relationships that I really truly believe, and maybe this is my sort of tinfoil hat part of me talking, that there is a, there's a belief in the world at large that, well, you're just, you know, maybe there's some people out there who behave badly and there's a group of you that we're just going to sacrifice in the name of that. Like it's almost as though some people just, that's just your bad luck that you're going to have to put up that toxic stuff but please don't make me call it out as toxic because then I have to change my whole little world view. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that we, so many people are literally imprisoned and we're letting them stay imprisoned because we're so uncomfortable in having this discourse that some people behave badly and then the, the, the turn is they've had a tough backstory. And I will say, I'm sorry. I really am sorry they had a back, bad backstory. I hope to heaven they're able to get the help they need and they are in what they're doing to this other person is unacceptable and their backstory is not an excuse. In this moment, they're harming someone else. Their backstory doesn't matter. Mm. How many people's empathy um, really does impact le letting narcissists get away with things? Oh, a, a thousand percent. The more empathic you are, the more likely narcissistic people are going to further down the track in your life because you're thinking, they didn't mean it. They've been through a lot. They had a rough mother. They don't have that much money. They have too much money. They are balancing so much with work and family. La, 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 ba, 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 ba. That, that empathy means we make allowances. We mm -hmm. attempt to understand the emotional experience. Of course, you're going to understand a person's history. You can be empathic and set a boundary. You can be empathic and protect yourself. You can say they have had, they've had a rough life and their behavior is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Those two things, two pancakes, they can co-locate. And then what are those words that you can say with empathy instead of accusation? Um, because I think that that's going to be important. You almost like can't, I assume you can't tell an empathic per person to not be empathic. No, never. But to then word things in a certain way. Like if somebody then, if a narcissist then goes to an emp uh, emp empathetic em person, empathic person yeah. empath and um, crosses that line, is verbally abusive, 
what are the things that that empath can say to the person to defend themselves Nothing. but still feel good about themselves? They can't say anything. That's the problem. Don't get into it. Somebody's abusing you, especially if there is, again, well, first time, sure, get into it with them sure. a little. But if, it's, if this is the 50th time, 100th time, you know where it ends up. So you don't get into it with them. You don't, you don't have to scream at them. You don't have to call them names. You don't have to storm away. You can look at them and say, I understand. And, you, and, and they're going to you and say, in an ideal situation, you can get out. You can't always. If the narcissist is raging at you in a car, what are you supposed to do? And that narcissist's favorite place to rage is the car. Really? Because you can't get out. And there's no one else to see. And, oh, yeah, assuming there's no one else to see. But let's assume if it's only two, mm. they love it. Because you really are stuck. And it, it's really kind of a bit of a gangster move to get out at a red light if you're 50 miles from home, right? Mm. I mean, you'd have to find a way home. It, it, feel, it might even feel dramatic. Like if you did that, even though I don't think it is, if somebody's raging at you and you could safely get out of a car at a red light or a stop sign and it's a safe place to get out, more people than not would judge the getter outer of the car mm. as being the problem than the rager in the car. Why? Because it's labeled as dramatic, quote unquote? Mm -hmm. Going back to societal interpretations. I mean, gaslighting. It's gaslighting. Mm. You're a dramatic for that. Obviously, if you're the driver, you can't really do that, can you? Like, if you're driving the car, the passenger is yelling at you. That would be a little bit. I mean, and and I and I don't think you'd be in a position to stop the car and tell them to get out. That would they be like a lot. They probably wouldn't, right? Right. They wouldn't. No. Yeah. So I do think that the challenge is, is that at those times, you can listen. And Lisa, as I say this. It, there's a recognition that some of these times there's a no win, right? That's the trap. It's the car. Mm -hmm. all, right? You can't defend yourself. You can't explain. You can't even be that reassuring because narcissistic people don't like when you reassure them if too much because then they feel weak. Mm -hmm. You can't cry because then they'll make fun of you or tell you you're weak. So you're literally in this cauldron of panic what do I do under if it any kind of circumstance if you can physically get out of the situation that's the way to go right but in those cases you can't you have to recognize that this is having a massive toll on you there's no other that's it because there, there's no escape it's like somebody blah, 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 punching at you and you're hunched over and you can't get out of the situation you're going to be bruised up before this is done, okay? And it will mess with your sympathetic nervous system. You are going to be frazzled and rattled. And the best you can do in those situations is then do the post-mortem. Say, that wasn't okay. How does this person fit in my life? How do I avoid being in these circumstances anymore? And I need to allow myself to rest, not take a nap, but like my nervous system needs a minute to get back online. And how do you rest that nervous system? What Literally that stop, like stop, mm -hmm. breathe, deep breaths. That oxygenation in the system really is sort of like, it, it's a sign to your brain, like everything's okay, mm -hmm. right? We're not running away. Cause that's, if you're running, <gasps> you're hyperventilating. Okay, that deep breath is like, it's, it's a sign. It's a recalibration. Um, you could sometimes find your heartbeat. Like you could just put a hand at your neck or your mm -hmm. pulse, like you're connecting mm -hmm. with your body. Hug yourself, hold yourself, okay? Get into a physical position that feels comfortable. For some people it might be lying down, be at a temperature that feels right. Some people find it useful to get into a shower or something like that. Mm. That can be a big, really, you, and you go into it. It's not like I'm doing this like this. I'm saying, I need to come down from this interaction. This hurt me. This felt unsafe. It took a toll on my system. I'm gonna be okay. But I'm, but I'm not just sitting here like this yeah. and just staring off into space. Right. I'm really talking myself down. That's in the worst case scenario, but, it, but there's no getting into it with them. And I think mm -hmm. that's the hard part for people. Mm -hmm. and, and some people may say, you know what? I want to get into it. I'm trapped in a car with them. So I'm going to go all in, go all in, be prepared. They're going to tear apart everything that matters to you. But some people say that's easier than enduring the blows. At least I'm throwing, mm -hmm. I'm landing a few punches of my own. I respect that. Just be ready that they're going to punch back 10 times harder.
God, yeah. Um, I'm actually, you know, glad that you added that last bit because that was like part of, I think for me to feel like I'm being pushed around, Correct. to feel like I have Correct. no defense, I'm just a punching yeah. bag. Like that makes me already feel weak. Correct. And so even punching back, even though I'm, mm-hmm. he may punch or they may punch mm-hmm. back harder, knowing that I feel like I've stood up for myself would mean something to me. And I'm glad you said that because some people say, is, is that it? We just have to lay down and, and just sort of lay down in front of them. No, the challenge is Lisa, that people go into sometimes that I'm going to, I'm, I'm getting into this mm-hmm. with you and they want to be heard. You got to go into this knowing you're not being heard. Mm-hmm. That's it. So like, I want to be heard. I want them to understand. They are not. No, none of that's happening. Right. But if it helps you to get in it with them, they're not listening to you. They're not learning from you. They're not having empathy for you. They don't care. But it may, like you said, it may be more authentic to yourself. You're saying, I'm going in because this is authentic to me. I am not lying down and listening to this. I'm not listening to them insult my kids or insult my work. And you're going to go in and they're going to gaslight, 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 manipulate, abuse, manipulate, abuse, criticize, criticize, contempt, 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 right? No apology, no responsibility taking. But you feel like at that moment, I was authentic to myself doesn't matter what they were saying, mm-hmm. I honored myself. Mm-hmm. This is all about honoring yourself. But if you have an agenda, I'm gonna say this, they need to listen, then keep your mouth shut. So have that reasoning ahead of time to know whether you're actually gonna be able mm-hmm. to achieve it or not. Like this is a pointless endeavor. Yeah. And you know, and listen, we all slip. I, there's, there's some narcissist in my life I have to deal with regularly. And there's a bandwidth issue too, you know, like, but you know, I always say like, everyone eats egg whites at breakfast and has a chocolate chip cookie smeared on their house, their face by 5 p.m., right? Why? Because somewhere between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., the day got the, your bandwidth yeah. with got depleted yeah. with the nasty phone call with the phone bill. And, and then the, the toilet stopped up and then you had a thing at work. And so by, again, you, you wake up ideally repleted, that bandwidth goes by five mm. and you're not the same egg white eater as you in the afternoon, right? You're like, just get me what I want. Like, ah. So you might be more likely to say something snipey back at the narcissist and have an argument. Like, it's my fault. I was doing so well at the beginning of the day. Keep in mind your bandwidth is going to deplete over the course of a day, over the course of a relationship. So you might say, I got it right nine times. And then the 10th time I slipped, I said, actually to me, Nine times you got it right and you didn't get into it and you only slipped once, bravo. That wasn't a loss, that was bandwidth. You were, that bandwidth of yours was getting depleted with each of these encounters. People go through this with family all the time, Mm -hmm. Lisa, because what happens is, let's say they go see their family for a week. Day one, day two, day three, they're keeping it together. By day six, they're like, shut up, okay, just shut up. And then you're thinking, oh, I was doing so good. And I'll say, you did great, you got to day six. Woo. Oh my God, I love that. And then also even just your hormones. If you're a female, and yeah. depending on when it is in your yeah. cycle, Could you're be. probably yeah. way Absolutely. more sensitive um, to be Not triggered. sensitive. We're going to say sensitive. Oh. You're going to be more React- responsive Re- to it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I always love it when you correct yeah. me with this, mm-hmm. this sort of thing. So you're going to be more responsive mm-hmm. to it depending mm-hmm. on when your cycle yeah. is. Mm-hmm. So maybe even knowing when your cycle is. When, Absolutely. So like, okay, this week yeah. is the week I definitely shouldn't I go see shouldn't my mom. shouldn't go see my mother or maybe you shouldn't go for a week. Right, right, right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I'd say to people like maybe you go and do your three days and maybe there's other people you know in that area. Give yourself a two day break out. You're, oh, my mom's going to scream and guilt at me. How could you leave me? How could you leave me? It choose your battles. Either she's going to yell at you for leaving for two days or you're going to get into it while you're in the house. Which one do you prefer? Pick. Yeah, definitely not in the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then there's an analogy that you said that really hit me and I think this is really beautiful for people to keep in mind when they're in these situations where you said that the narcissist is trying to play tennis mm-hmm. and you're playing a game of solitaire. Yeah, or soccer or just entirely different game. Yeah. But like, I really like that analogy because it's like the person's trying to react, right? They want you to hit the ball back. Yes, so they're baiting you. keep you. going. That's mm-hmm. their game. Mm-hmm. But the game of solitaire is like, it's you. It's me. I'm playing this with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. They, they want you to interact because for them, this is a very interesting thing. It's part of the reason narcissistic people, I think, are so successful. They're not afraid of conflict, right? And conflict aversion is very common in trauma bonded people. Mm. They don't like conflict. So you often give in, you capitulate, you relent. Like you're saying, I like to take the fight sometimes. You're also an incredibly successful woman. And it doesn't surprise me. Like you're like, I'm not gonna sort of lay down what someone else would say, 
I can't, I can't do this. This, mm -hmm. this completely shreds me to do this. So they're more conflict averse. And in the way our economy is set up, if you're conflict averse, it's actually harder to get things done, right? It's harder to fire people. It's harder to negotiate a deal. It's harder to, you know, put your, put your, put a boundary down when someone's taking advantage of you, right? If you're not willing to get into the fight and someone else will be like, fine, just pay them, just pay them. If you do that enough, you could be out hundreds of thousands of dollars just giving in mm -hmm. on stuff, right? Or keep a really bad employee around for another five years or something like that. So I do think that people who in our society, in the United States, who are more willing to have take a fight to have a fight do succeed more and narcissistic people conflict for them doesn't bother them because it's all about ego and it's about them flexing their ego they're not thinking about you they don't care about your nervous system they don't care about your feelings they don't care if you're hurt they just don't care this feels good for them you're in it and you're thinking this is really uncomfortable for me and you don't want to have that conflict. It doesn't feel good. So they like it. They and you know what? And this is something that comes up all the time. That someone was asking me this recently: is how this person said such terrible things to me. It was like they were gunning for a terrible fight. And yet, I saw them a week later, and they were acting like things were normal or regular. And I was still like, wah. And that's a very common kind of a pattern in narcissistic relationships where they will just go off on you and then the next time they'll see you it's like everything's fine and you feel very unsafe in their presence you don't feel uncomfortable you're walking on eggshells narcissistic people are really good at compartmentalization and they use that conflict as a place to regulate it's like they just let it all out they feel good they don't stop to think that this was shattering for you mm -hmm. and if you were to say I'm still struggling with last week. They'll be like, gosh, like get over yourself. Gaslight. Gaslight. Those so, are the cycles. So it's almost like a, a perfect relationship for a narcissist is to find someone who has had the trauma so that they don't want the conflict. Bingo. And they do that all the time. Who do you think they pick? Because they're the, the people with the trauma bonds are the folks who stick around. Mm -hmm. As a very trauma bonded mm -hmm. person, I'll, I will attest to that because you are scared. You're scared of disappointing them. You're scared of their rage. You're, you're still the child cowering in front of the narcissistic parent. And it, it's not like narcissistic people are walking around saying, let me find the weakest person in the room. Not by a long shot. And I don't want people to think like, they picked me because I'm weak. No, they picked you because there was something quite fabulous about you. That's what grabbed them about you. Whatever your fabulosity was, mm -hmm. you're Maybe it was because you're lit up the room, maybe because you were gorgeous, maybe because you have this incredible ability, because you're smart. Narcissistic people are fussy, like they, but they didn't, and so they don't, they just, they picked you because you're lovely, right? Then once they've got you, they mistreat you. If you don't walk away, then they're going to keep mistreating you and you're going to turn your light off. Right, so the very thing that might have attracted them to you initially fades because that was all you, but you had to give up you to be in the relationship. And then they have contempt for you, but they're the reason your light faded. Mm. But even if they're shining, I assume a narcissist doesn't want your light to shine when you're around Correct. them. Correct, so they wanted you initially because you made them look good, but then they don't want it anymore. Oh my God, yeah, <laughs> what the hell? That's a trip to get your head around, mm -hmm. especially if you're thinking of yourself as the victim. Oh my God, I'm mm -hmm. weak. That's why they chose me. And actually, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Girl, Mike, drop there. I, I can keep talking to you forever. That was so freaking amazing. This episode has blown my mind. It's great. It Where can great people find you? Oh, everything please you're find doing. Me. So I, you can find me on YouTube. Yeah, Dr. Romani is my YouTube channel. Please listen to my podcast, Navigating Narcissism. We've been nominated for an AMBI, I'm which is so like the happy. Oscars for the podcast. So it's really a critically acclaimed podcast. You'll learn from it's conversations I have with people survivors, experts, you learn so much about the, the nuts and bolts of narcissism. Um, you can, if you, people are really working on healing from narcissistic abuse, go to my website, drromany.com, D-O-C-T-O-R, Romany, R-A-M-A-N-I, put my name in narcissism, you'll find it. Mm -hmm. If you go to my website, you could, if you want to, if you're interested, you can go to my healing program. I have books out there. You can learn about all of that on my website. And so, yeah, and, and follow me on social media, Dr. Romani, because we're always putting out new stuff, but trying to really kind of wrap the world in this knowledge. So at a minimum, I'm never going to stop people from being narcissistic, Lisa. But what I can do is help break people from these cycles of self-blame 
and turning off their own lights to make these relationships work. Keep watching to learn the signs that he's not the one for you. I want to ask, how on earth do we end up in relationships that we just settle for, but that we actually know deep down wasn't right to begin with? Ooh, there's, <laughs> there's so many ways to go with this. Um, first, the fear that we won't find better. You know, e even though we know it's not for us, even though we're not fully happy, you know, a lot, especially women, women have been conditioned to believing that, well, all guys are trash and, and all guys are going to hurt you. And so better to deal with the trash, you know, than to put yourself out there for new trash to deal with. And so that leads a lot of women to settling, you know, um, as well as just validating the what's lacking in that relationship due to what they saw in their parents relationship. A lot of people saw their mothers settle, you know, saw, saw dysfunction in their in their childhood. And so now I've seen situations where a woman has told herself, well, I still have it better than my mother, so I shouldn't complain. You know, I, I should just be happy that it's not as bad as she had it. You know, so much of a, a lack of healing causes people to settle. And it's just a it's just a horrible cycle that so many people are in. Can I just jump in on that thing that you said? Because that's so strong. Do you think that there's something about the fact that if we've had a dysfunctional relationship in the past or if we've seen it in our parents, that part of us doesn't necessarily know if there is going to be better. And so it's... I don't know if this is the best. So for instance, my ex-boyfriend, before I met my husband, he would tell me on the daily, you're never going to find someone that loves you as much as I love you. And I believed it. And so it was the fear of, can I even find better than him? So maybe it's better just to stay with him so that I don't end up by myself with nothing. Absolutely. And that's the thing. It's like women are settling for a piece of a man rather than hoping they can receive a whole man. And so, you know, they'll deal with the, the nonsense, not to mention you have a lot of women who are surrounded by other women who also accept settling. So essentially, I always tell women, if you go to another woman and ask her, should I stay or should I leave? And she has held on to a relationship that she doesn't belong in. She's going to tell you to stay because she has to validate why she's still there. She can't tell you to leave when she couldn't look at herself in the mirror and take that step. So, so many people are being given bad advice and, and like you said, uh, been brainwashed in various ways. As your example, it may have been their partner who drilled it in their head. You won't find anything better. And they really start to believe that. And it's just, it gets too scary to take a chance, so to speak, on putting yourself out there, being alone again and hoping you can find better. Yeah, God, that's amazing. Okay, so let's start unpacking all of this. Where do we need to start from, right? Because there's different elements. There's somebody of making the choice now, they're single, they're trying to find someone that they you know, want to fall in love with. So what are the, I'd like to go over the fundamentals that you believe that every single relationship must have um, to give us that fighting chance, if you will. What do you think are the absolute fundamentals that a relationship needs that you've never heard of any successful relationship ever working out without these things? Okay, so what, and let me first, uh, to put it in proper context, when we say successful, I want people to understand staying together does not equate success. A happy, fruitful relationship equates success, all right? So you see a lot of people who deal with the damage, are miserable, but they're still in the relationship. Let's not, you know, congratulate that. Let's not glorify that in any kind of way. So now that we understand it's about fruitful, happiness, purpose in that relationship, the number one thing is healing. Having to heal from your past. I think I, most people, even if they got in their relationship without healing first, at some point had to do the work if they were going to survive and be able to stay together. They weren't going to be able to push it all the way through and again, be happy, fruitful, purposeful without healing. And so much of the dysfunction that we experience in our relationships stem from previous experiences, whether that be childhood, a previous relationship, there's always something that we're dragging into that relationship. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that because of the whole boyfriend girlfriend dynamic we've made it harder on marriage because by the time people even get to someone that they could marry 
They've been beaten down so much emotionally that some people don't have the energy and willingness to fight at that moment. And it seems too scary because the person that you is truly best for you makes you feel more vulnerable than anyone else will. And so now, if you are still holding on to trauma, you are more than likely going to run from that, sabotage that. Like you, you have got to really have a strong support system to even weather that storm if you have yet to have, uh, heal. So healing is huge, huge part of it. Um, the other foundation I would say is finding and loving yourself. You know, the reality is if you don't know who you are, then you don't know who belongs in your life. You, you don't know who's the right fit. You don't know who you align with properly as you move forward. And so too many people are dating or establishing relationships, trying to be something they're not or not tapping into their true self. And so now you get this, and to put it in the context of women, you get this guy to fall for you, but who he fell for is not a woman you can sustain because you're not really that woman. And so now at some point, the true colors come out, he gets mad, you're frustrated with him, and now the whole thing blows up. So better to save yourself that headache by being your true authentic self from the jump and then see who's the guy who truly embraces that and loving yourself because without loving yourself, you are more than likely going to settle. You are more than likely going to accept dysfunctional relationships. You're going to entertain and tolerate men who don't belong in your life. So it's important to not just know yourself, but love yourself as well and be confident in knowing that, listen, the, the true you is going to be embraced by a man who truly loves that woman, you know? And so you don't have to try to fit into everyone else's box. But let me add to when it comes to knowing yourself and loving yourself, that doesn't mean accepting a flaw as if it can't be correctable. All right. It isn't, oh, well, I just have a bad attitude or I'm just super blunt. No, you're rude and you're <laughs> negative. OK, like, don't don't play this. Or that's just how I am. No, that's a correctable issue that needs improvement. So let's identify what are the actual flaws that need to be corrected versus who we are. So and just to put it, give an example, who you are may be a woman who loves nature. You love to go outside. You like traveling. That's who you are. But again, that bad attitude, that's who you became because you haven't resolved past trauma, because you haven't flushed out the negative energy from your spirit. So recognize the difference between who you are and who you become due to all these outside influences or negative influences. And so the, the last thing I would say, and, and we can name a lot of different things, but the biggest foundational piece after that is connection. And I believe that, again, I'm a firm believer that women know connection, but unfortunately, they, they throw it out the window when they see something that they like or when they want a reason to hold on to something that they don't belong in. So essentially, it's down, like... Break those two down because those were super powerful. <laughs> All right. So what, when it's something that you like, so for example... Women know, and, and, and to give some context to connection, to me, that is a deeper spiritual occurrence. It's like your spirit recognizing its match. And it's that person you can truly be yourself with, be vulnerable with. It's, it's a next level type of vibe, type of energy. Because again, we can meet a lot of people we like. We may love a lot of people. We do not feel a connection with everybody. All right. That's a very unique experience. And women, again, because you guys are so in tune, emotionally, spiritually, like women have a great uh, sense of, or a great ability to sense, to feel things. So you guys can feel when that connection is there, when it's not. But now she meets a guy and let's say his resume is exactly what she wanted. Let's say, just to give an example, he's, he's successful, he's tall, he looks great, an amazing guy on paper. And this woman says, oh my gosh, I cannot pass this up. I want this. And so even in your interaction with him, the connection is not there. But your desire for him is so strong, you're just falling for the, the, the hype in the moment. Okay, all the smoke and mirrors right now. But once that goes away, you're not going to be happy here. And then in regards to ignoring it when it's something that you want to hold on to and not leave, again, it goes back to 
women being in those relationships where they're settling, where, where they know this guy's not for them, they now ignore the fact that they know a connection does not exist because, again, the fear of being alone, the fear of starting all over, uh, the fear of aging. Th let's be real. A lot of women, due to the fear of aging, uh, rush into relationships and hold on to men that don't belong in their lives. And so all these different fears causes her to try to rationalize past connection. And even more, uh, more importantly, she rationalizes past her intuition. Because in knowing connection for women, they know their intuition. They know their intuition is saying, this guy's not it. But they want so bad to make this work, so they give themselves all the reasons to push forward anyway. Oh my God, I love that so much. And I heard you say that um, connection cannot be built and connection cannot be destroyed. It's one of those you either have it or you don't. Can you take me through that? Because I think people, and I've also heard you say people try to rationalize the, the connection on if they don't necessarily have it and why they're with somebody. Um, and so explain to me that on like why we can never rationalize it. And then also how we rationalize our intuition that's telling us that we should be settling. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So now with connection being there or it's not. So again, there's a couple of ways to look at this one for anyone who's spiritual, you know, there's a belief that says things happen in the spirit before they happen in the physical. Okay. And so if that is a true, a, a true dynamic, then it would make perfect sense that the connection already existed. There is, it, it didn't come about physically first. It existed in the spiritual. And again, that's why I said it's our spirits recognizing the match, recognizing that person it can uh, bond with, so to speak. And so there's that aspect of it, but also the fact that if you sit down and you speak to people who have experienced connection, the story is always the same. It's always this something that they felt very quickly. It didn't take months, years for them to figure it out. It was very initial, you know, first maybe conversation, first day, first week. It was very in the beginning. And again, these people can have stories where they fall apart because having a connection doesn't guarantee two people are going to be together because there's so many things that throw the situation off. But these people can fall apart. It can be 10, 20 years. They come back together and it's like they never stop talking. There's nothing that you can do to change that. You can run from it. You can be in denial of it, but it's still there, you know? And, and so when we try to rationalize past connection, well, unfortunately, society has taught us or taught many people to have relationships for business purposes, to have relationships just for the sake of family structure and not saying that these things don't play a role, but they don't teach people about connection, you know? Even when people come to me and say, well, arranged marriages are the way to go because they have such a low divorce rate. And I'm like, listen, have you ever sat down with women in arranged marriages? <laughs> I, I can tell you, I've seen communities of them where they look like their spirit is gone, where they're not happy. Now, I'm not saying that's every arranged marriage, but what I'm saying to you is you can't force two people together and think it's just gonna be happy and great. Yes, they may find a way to manage and cope, but I am not here to encourage people to just tolerate a relationship. I want two people to flourish within a relationship. And that means getting with that person that you truly connect with. And so a lot of people just don't understand the concept. They, it, it's foreign to them and many have yet to experience it. So it's very hard to fully grasp this when you haven't been hit with it yet. But anyone who's experienced connection this resonates with them. I say it's like having an orgasm for a woman. It's like once you had it, you know. <laughs> I, I can't there ain't really no going explain. Back, There's no going back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like when it happens, you're gonna know. Plain and simple. Yeah. All right. And, and and now, which brings me to the rationalization past intuition. What happens now is women confuse intuition and fear. All right. And they allow fear to overrun their intuition. Now, I explain to women, listen, the difference between fear and intuition is that fear requires logic. Fear requires you to analyze. Well, I can't do this because I might, you know, this might happen. I can't take this jump because I might fall. I can't invest here because I might go broke. It's the logic that's making you fearful of the, the negative consequences. Intuition requires no logic. 
Intuition is independent of any facts. You can be in a room, the whole environment can look great, and something in you, in your spirit says, leave, you don't belong here, you need to go, something is wrong. That's intuition. And so what happens with a lot of women is, they might meet this man, they might feel this connection, but now the analyzation comes in. Now the, the, the logic of, well, wait a minute, what if he's just playing games? What, what if I'm wrong? I've been wrong about these men before. How can I trust this guy? All of this starts to overrun them, and now they allow that to pull them out of the situation or to sabotage it because they can't allow themselves to believe it. And again, that, that also stems from that lack of healing that has now contaminated their thinking. And that's why I tell women or I encourage women, stop analyzing, start feeling. A woman's power is in feeling. Like, just quiet yourself for a second, visualize the moment, visualize what's going on, and tell me what you're feeling. Because when you start to get in your own head, women will drive themselves insane getting inside their own head and coming up with all these different possible conclusions. No, what do you feel? What do you sense? Because I've yet to find a woman who says her intuition is wrong. So the key is we need to learn how to remove the fear, tap into the intuition and walk confidently in it. I love that because you, you're you not just saying feel it because there is something to like, right? The intoxication of love or the intoxication of attraction. You know, if you're just like, okay, I feel it. Oh, I'm really turned on by him. And then you go into it. But there's a big difference between that and then sitting and listening to your gut intuition. Okay. So let's, let's assume someone's found the connection and they've gone through it and they've analyzed, they've analyzed, but they've also allowed themselves to feel that, um, you know, in, in touch with their, um, intuition and everything seems great. And you really believe this one's this this is the right person. And then you get into the relationship and then five, 10 years down the line, you end up being completely splintered. What are the hurdles that you find in your practice that you, when you, you know, speak to people where people just like, they keep stumbling over these things and this is what ends up splintering the relationship five or 10 years down the line. Okay. Number one, a lack of emotional maturity. So, what I have found is with men and women, we have not learned how to manage our emotions. And especially in today's society, it has become even more reactive. People get offended, they react. People see something, they react. There is no processing, there is no taking a step back. So now when you, when you act that way within a relationship, imagine your partner does something, you could interpret it wrong, you react, you now say something hurtful in that moment because you're mad. You don't really mean it, but that's how you felt in that moment. Now they're hurt by it. Now they're damaged. Now they retaliate. And then boom, the cycle goes from there. And, and what we have to understand is, especially within relationships where two people have a connection, this is the person who can hurt you the most and make you the happiest. That, that's the, the, the scary thing about it. It's like they have the power in a sense to crush you, but to make you feel like no other person can. And so I always say the person that a woman loves most has the least room for error. So like when you see relationships where a woman is constantly being mistreated, but she keeps going back to him and she says, well, cause I love him. No, you don't love him. You have an unhealthy attachment to him. Your ability to continuously take that mistreatment and that toxic behavior and go back to him shows me it's not love. When we're loving someone and we're really into them, one little mistake can hurt like no other. And again, going back to the emotional maturity, if you don't learn how to not just react, how to communicate before we assume, before we come to our own conclusions, that can easily derail the relationship. So I definitely think a lack of uh, emotional maturity. I also think lack of healing. Lack of healing is going to always be uh, a thorn in the side of relationships, all right? Because again, sometimes our partners do things that trigger us, but that trigger stems from past trauma we haven't resolved, all right? And they're not even aware sometimes of what they did or how it's in, uh, impacting us. And so if we don't learn how to let go of our past traumas and issues and hurts, we run a high risk of things going left in that relationship, especially with someone we have a connection with. And like I said, the person you have a connection with, everything's magnified. So it's going to hit harder with them. So the third thing 
is unrealistic, unrealistic expectations of people and our partners. And what I mean by that is this idea of, it's like you said, uh, someone meets a connection, they think, okay, we're good now, we're gonna succeed. No, 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 no. You're still two human beings. You are still two people who can fall short at any time, at any day. If we don't give grace to each other, we are going to have a big problem here. We've got to recognize the difference between the person who does not belong in our life and continues to do wrong and the person who does belong in our life but makes mistakes. Right. Okay? Yes. And, and so once we know, listen, we have a connection. I know that I want to go through the storms with you. You're the person that I'm supposed to be with. Now let's remember that in our moment of struggle. Because again, everyone's going to make a mistake. You're, you're going to do something, especially the longer you've been together, you're going to mess up some way, somehow. You may say something you shouldn't have. You may insult them in a way, you know, something, something. It happens, but there needs to be grace and understanding. We are human beings. We're going to fall short. We got to embrace that forgiveness always with our partner. And again, communicate. And that's the other thing. Communication would be the other pitfall. A lack of proper communication can derail any situation. And so you, you've got to be willing and establish very early on a willingness and an, a, a safe space for both partners to be able to talk about anything. We should not have to hold on to how we're feeling with each other, because if we do, that is a recipe for disaster. You, you said that a problem sometimes in long relationships is you are not maintaining who they fell in love with. Mm. Dude, I was screaming when I heard you say that. Break that down on what that means and let's dive deep. Okay. So one, let me say that that whole premise started with a long time ago, I was having a discussion about monogamy. And you know, there are people out there who argue monogamy isn't natural. And I've always argued, no, monogamy actually is natural. If it was unnatural, then we wouldn't even be able to embrace it for a period of time. And when you examine relationships, you realize that most people are able to go a year, two, three, five, whatever, being completely monogamous and being happy. But then at some point, there tends to be a fall off with most people. So I said, okay, the issue is not monogamy, it's maintaining monogamy. And the reason why we struggle to maintain monogamy is because we don't maintain who they fell in love with. And so essentially you have these situations where people in the beginning are bringing their best selves or at least bringing a best version of something, okay? And we, we can't act like physical attraction is not a serious part of romantic relationships. Plain and simple. It, it is the actual, the final ingredient. Like if, if we didn't need physical attraction, there would be a lot of friends getting together right now. <laughs> yes. Okay, plain and simple. <laughs> but the, and the only thing that stops them is you're not attracted to them like that. So now when you have physical attraction that helps bring two people together and then you have one or more parties saying, well, it should not matter for me to have to maintain myself. What do we expect to see happen? And you'll hear a lot of these couples say, well, the flame is gone. In most of those cases, the flame left with the attraction, plain and simple. But there was something in the beginning that made it good enough or, or, or strong for those people to be happy. And, and again, it's not just the physical part, it's the emotional part. It, it's how we talk to each other, how we treat each other. We have to get back to where things were good. So whenever someone says to me, how do we get the flame back? I say, what was in place when the flame was there? What was, what was going on at the time when everything was feeling good? We have to identify all the factors. How were you two looking? How were you two treating each other? everything. And now let's do our best to recreate that environment. And you will see a huge difference in your relationship. I love that so much because, so I've been with my husband now for 20 years. We've been married for 18. And this is something we talk about a lot. We, we don't um, expect to have the same amount of fire or electricity that we did when we were first met. I think if you do a, a brain scan of someone that's just met there, it looks like they're on drugs, right? Because they're so intoxicated with the love potion. Um, also I want to add that there's something as you were talking, I was like, you know what? Like if it was me and I was letting myself go, I don't think like for Tom, it would even be the, the visual 
change. It would be that that would have a knock on effect on how I show up every day. So I think I would be less confident. I think I would feel be more insecure. So it's not about just the, like, if we're talking about looks for a second, where it's like people have just kind of let themselves go and they're like, ah, I've been in a marriage for 20 years. He just needs to love me for who I am. I've never done that or said that ever because it's not just about the eye attraction to the physicalities. It's how you show up. Tom loves it that I'm a bit of a badass and I don't take shit from him when he gives it to me, right? And so it's like, but now imagine I show up and I'm super insecure and I'm very um, in, um very sensitive because I don't feel good about myself, right? So now it's not just, hey, I've changed physically. It's as an interaction where he likes to tease me and I'll give him one back, right? And we have like this banter. But now imagine he teases me and I get insulted and I'm all upset and I'm more sensitive. So it really does have this massive knock-on effect that people think is superficial because it's like, oh, they don't have the six-pack abs that you fell in love with, let's say. And it's like, it's not about that. It's about everything that you just said and I just encapsulated. Like, it's so strong and people don't talk about it. People don't talk about it enough because they get defensive. Absolutely. And, and that's such an awesome point because it reminds me of another situation where uh, this one woman, she did gain weight. Husband had no problem with it. But what would happen was she became insecure in the bedroom where she did not want to have sex because she didn't like the way she looked. And even though he would tell her, you're beautiful to me, I still I don't have any problems with this. She had an internal conflict. So like you said, it it, it, it goes beyond the physical and the impact it will now have. And I don't think people understand how much when we deviate from that person, how much that now affects us in all areas of our life. And, and again, now, are you that energetic woman anymore? Are you positive anymore? And that's why it's about not just how you look, but how you treat them, how you talk to them, the energy that you bring to the table. All of that needs to be maintained if we want to see the relationship continue to thrive and get even better. Mm -hmm. And I know, at least just from my husband, these are things that make him confident, right? Like that when he feels mm -hmm. good about himself and when he feels good about himself, he's in a good mood. So like everything has this knock on effect that even in the reverse with a guy, I think that the insecurity would come out and the, yes. um, you know, oh, well, you look at him because they're insecure about themselves. Yes. Or they're not, they're not satisfying their, per their woman. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the last thing I want to add to that is there's a lot of people who say, well, I would never leave somebody if they let themselves go physically or whatever. The problem is, yeah, you stayed, but you don't touch them the same. You don't talk to them the same anymore. You don't respect them the same anymore. Your treatment of them has deviated because the attraction, and, and, and again, especially for women, attraction encompasses more than physical. Like if he doesn't, if you love his ambitious drive and his, that ambitious drive is gone now, that's going to impact your attraction to him. And so staying with him, you don't get an award for staying if you can't still bring your best. If you're not going to still pour into your partner the same, then you can't, you can't think it's a good thing. Like I, I'll hear even men say, well, I wouldn't leave her. Okay, great, but will you still love her the same? And when I say love her, will you still pour into her the same? If you will, great. But if you're going to deviate from that, we still have a problem. So true. But how do you then go about having that conversation? So let's say uh, my audience is prim primarily female. So let's assume a female has a husband or a partner that hasn't got that drive anymore as part of what they fell in love with him. You know, he really loved, um, you know, going to the gym so he can pick her up and be strong for her or whatever it is. And slowly, slowly over time, he's let go of the drive. He's let go of his uh, whatever it is that we fell in love with him for how do you even approach that in a way where that the, the your partner can still feel loved can still hear hey i love you but everything's an improvement like how do you even approach that and then how do you help them or in fact do you help them okay so a few angles to cover one if you are not in a relationship yet this is where you need to understand establish this kind of dynamic as early as possible we have to have discussions while we're getting to know each other and dating how about how we're going to handle a scenario like this. I really believe people don't dive deep enough into each other 
and, and visualize, okay, how are things going to look if we're in a relationship together? How do we handle this kind of scenario? Let's talk about all these things, but let's establish that, hey, if we're unhappy with something, we should be allowed to talk to each other about it and not be offended. We have to be willing to listen to constructive criticism on both ends. Now, if you're already in the relationship and you have not established this, the, the best way, because there's no easy way, but the best effective way, in my opinion, would be via a letter. And the reason why is because if you come to them verbally, number one, verbal communication of deep concerns, issues, feelings tend to not go well. People get defensive. They deflect. You can get distracted. You may not get everything out. So much can go wrong that can derail the purpose of the conversation, all right? Some people end up talking for an hour and never got to the root of the issue that they were supposed to talk about, okay? <laughs> Whereas via a letter, you're able to get everything out. You're able to check your tone to, to make sure that you are also adding love to the criticism. So you don't want to just say, listen, I think you've fallen off. And I don't like the direction this is going. You got to start with saying, listen, I love so-and-so. Like it's a compliment sandwich, so to speak. And open yourself up to theirs as well. You, you got to come in. Because th the one thing I've learned with relationships is, or one of the things I've learned is that people don't like to be singled out. Mm -hmm. No one likes to be told they're the partner with the issues. They're the partner that fell off. So you want to be able to come in and recognize, okay, you know what? Maybe there's some things I need to improve or I'm open to hearing any issues that you may have that you haven't expressed. But I want to make sure you understood where I stand and what, how I'm seeing things. All of these uh, uh, pieces of it will help soften it to where they can receive it more. All right. But I have to say this. And some people may not like this, but I'm going to have to say it anyway. <laughs> I love how honest you are. I even said it in my intro. That's like so exciting for me. I want the no BS, Stefan. Absolutely. So I, I believe that in a lot of cases, I'm going to say most cases, where people let themselves go, again, whether it's in treatment, physically, whatever, and especially if they know it's an issue for their partner, or more specifically when they know it's an issue or having an impact, it's a sign that you're just not in love with that person. It's a sign that there may not be a connection there. And the reason why I say that is because of this. You find a woman, and, and, and let's please understand the difference between going through a rough patch versus we just don't care. And it's probably been years, all right? And we're not doing anything about this. Women who are into their man want to look good for that man. And if... How they're looking or, or letting themselves go is having an impact on this man that they, they, you know, value so much. They'll want to do something about it. Many women, when they don't care, is because they don't look at him like that. It's the same way with men where when a man's with a woman he loves, he's inspired. There's this natural inspiration, this fire that's in you because of this woman where you want to go harder for her. You want to accomplish more also for her. She is part of your drive, okay? When that's non-existent, then I do have to question, were you really in love? Now, I'm not, again, nothing's 100%. It's exception to every rule. But from the situations I've seen, it's rare to find a couple who lets themselves go, doesn't care, know what's having an impact on the relationship, and the relationship is not healthy and happy, but yet you're telling me you guys are in love with each other and there's a connection. Oh, Stefan. Okay, so I'm going to push back here. All so right. <laughs> what, but why, why do you think that that's the case? Because for me, I would actually go to, there's something going on with them. They're insecure. They're losing their self-esteem. Self they're losing their confidence. And things are happening to them where they're not prioritizing it. And then it becomes a, I'm struggling right now. And so... They just need to love me, right? They need to love me for how I am. But it's interesting that you perceive it as it's about them versus about the person that's going through the emotion. So this is why I made to, I, I want to make sure I said there's a difference between going through that rough period, which I do think people go through. Like we all go through moments where we may be a little depressed. We may have lost motivation. We don't have the same energy. We're going through some things. I think all of that is understandable. And that's why I wanted to make sure I added like an example where it may be years because 
people who right. are truly into each other, who love each other, we're going to have our rough patches, but we're going to be able to get through that and get to something better. When you remained in that and there's no desire to push past that, there's no attempt to work through this. That to me says, no, this is not struggle. This is no motivation whatsoever from the fact that this person has inspired you. And, and, and consider it like this. To a woman, it's like, well, why should I go ahead and, and hit the gym for a man who doesn't even listen, for a man who doesn't even talk to me anymore, who doesn't treat me the same? So again, his lack of pouring into you keeps you unmotivated, all right? Same way I've seen some men who feel like, well, why should I do anything about it? She doesn't have sex with me anyway. She doesn't listen to what I say. I don't get any respect in this house. Why should I be better for her? But again, so that speaks to, is there really love here? And, 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 and to be honest with you, I want to say this. The majority of people are not with the person they most love. The majority of people Ooh. are not with they have a connection with. So it's not surprising to me when I see this dynamic happen all the time. And again, show me two people who have a connection. Show me two people who truly love each other. And I'll show you two people who at some point will fight through and get back on track. And if, if not even not fall completely off track when it comes to maintaining themselves for their partner. You know what I'm saying? Like they have a different fuel that allows them to thrive and push past. Whereas when that connection is not there, it's like, man, forget them. I don't mm. care. Good. I love how raw you are about your feedback <laughs> because it really, like, I just want to know the truth, right? Once we know the truth, then we can assess. But a lot of people do, um, you know, they protect their own emotions because they don't want to feel badly about themselves. And for me, I always go back to what's the goal? Like, what's the goal in my relationship? Is the goal for me to always feel great? Or is the goal for us to always get through issues and keep connecting? Because let me tell you, I didn't know any relationship where you, you have that real talk and you always feel great. Like, you don't feel great because you're assessing the things that you may have done wrong, the things that you you've maybe let go of. And I made it a point maybe about five years ago that I turned to my husband and we made this list of questions. When we'd go on vacation, we'd just ask each other a bunch of questions. And there was one question that I found so powerful for myself. And it, I asked him this on Valentine's Day, in fact. I said, what's the thing that I used to do for you that I've stopped that you wish I started doing again? Mm, that's an awesome question. Now, here's the thing. It, he's gonna say things that may upset me, right? It's like, oh, you used to do, right? Like, you used to do this for me and you used to do this for me. And so, in going into that, I said to myself, in asking this question, I need to be very open to the answer because it's gonna, it may upset me. Okay, well, if it upsets me, then why am I asking the question? I'm doing it because my goal is to make sure that I have a long lasting, happy, successful relationship. And so, once I've kind of told myself why I'm doing it, I then, my, my guard gets down and then all. Also, like you said, it gives me an opportunity for him to then ask me. So I've asked him and he's like, okay, babe, what's the thing that you wish I now start doing? And because I've left myself open to that, I now have the space to be able to tell him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you see how when him now putting himself out there in the same way, like that makes things so much easier. When both parties are willing to be open to the criticism, that makes both parties more receptive to it. And it helps. No one wants to be the only one saying, well, you're wrong. You need to do this. And then we end it there. It's like, no, let's share with each other what we can be doing better, how we can be making each other happier. That should always be the goal. And, and I honestly think like people should have relationship checkups. So, you know, you said you do it on vacations, whether it be maybe once every three months or six months or once a year. At some point, we need to sit down and have an understanding that this is the day that we sit down and get everything out, what's missing, what needs to return, you know, what needs to be adjusted. If we kept doing that, I really believe you would see more relationships succeed. Stefan, I love that idea. There should be like a, a plan of like, all right, on this day, every six months, because if you set it up, ahead of time when there's no problem now mm. there's not that like oh god he wants to talk to me what's wrong oh my god yes. right like that panic so if you just go every six months we agree we're going to have a meet a meeting and we're going to sit down kind of like what you do with the business right you go over the PL, you go over the data you see what's working you see what doesn't i love this idea 
and, and here's the other part of that psychologically that happens. You know how at work, if you know your review is coming up, you tighten up because yes. you don't want to walk into that review <laughs> knowing you have things that you've been missing. So if we know we have the relationship checkup coming up, people will start to naturally tighten up because nobody wants to come in being the one who wasn't doing their job. So it has a positive impact in a, on a various levels. Oh my God, I love that so much. That was hilarious. Um, and there's one thing actually that I also want to touch upon that you said is when I take care of myself, when I put on my knee high boots and when I put on lacy underwear, I feel a different way. And so... I do it for myself, right? Like I obviously do it because I like the way my husband looks at me, you know, when I'm wearing that outfit, but it goes back into once I start to go, what makes me feel good? And then I show up by feeling good. Then it has that knock on effect. So not just thinking I'm dressing this way for him. It's like, I'm dressing this way for me to feel good about myself so that then we can get together. And you know what? And I'm glad you brought that up because that that is a very important part. And this is where I think it, it kind of goes with the connection in the sense that we this is where people have to be their true selves. So for I'll use me, for example. I like a woman that likes to look good. I've come to the realization that not every woman cares to have to do the whole dressing up and nails or whatever. Some women don't care for that. That's not their thing. And so now if, if we get together not being honest about who we are and what we like, we, we have this mismatch to where now I'm trying to get you to dress up and that's not really what makes you feel good. However, if we have that connection, we're on the same page and now you enjoy looking good. I enjoy you looking good. Now it's easy because when you make yourself look good for you, I still benefit because we're on the same page here. We wanted the same things, you know, and I think this is where people have to recognize, OK, uh, yes, we, we, we have to make sure we are creating that happiness within us because that's what's going to pour out to our partners and to our lives. But we also want to make sure that we're with partners that align with us. All right. That embrace what we embrace. So now to maintain and sustain those things, as we talked about earlier, maintain the person they fell in love with becomes so much easier because I love that person too. So the person you love, I love. <laughs> okay. Now we're good. But if I don't love being this person, but you want me to be that, now we have this huge disconnect and things won't work in the long run. To learn the key signs that you're dealing with a narcissist and how to set boundaries, click here. You can be the total package at the wrong address. So just because you're single does not mean that there is something off within you. If you're not careful,